Morning everyone and welcome to the seventh meeting in 2015 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. Can I remind everyone to switch off mobile phones as they do affect the broadcasting system. As meeting papers are provided in digital format, you may see tablets being used during the meeting. Uh, our first agenda item today is for the committee to take further evidence on its freight transport in Scotland inquiry. This week the committee will hear from a range of experts from the transport sector. Can I welcome uh, Derek Holden? From, of Derek Holden Cons Consultancy, Professor Dr Alan McKinnon, Head of Logistics at Kuhn Logistics University in Hamburg, Germany, and Dr Maya Piercek, Deputy Director at the Centre for Sustainable Road Freight at Heriot Watt University. Good morning. Um, perhaps I could kick off our session this morning and um, direct our first question at you, Professor McKinnon. Um, as you were the advisor to the Local Government and Transport Committee's 2006 inquiry into freight transport in Scotland. Can you summarise for the committee what the impact um, of that, assuming there was an impact, uh, of that inquiry was and what difference it has made to the freight industry in Scotland since the report was published? Yes, OK. Um, the motivation, I think, for that study back in 2006 um, was a petition from the Road Haulage Association at the time who felt that the Scottish road haulage industry um, was uh, subject to increased foreign competition and they felt that competition was unfair because uh, foreign hauliers were moving into the UK and with fuel they had bought outside the country. Um, so that was a big issue that was addressed by the committee. Uh, th there wasn't a great deal could be done because m many of the powers resided in Westminster rather than here in the Scottish Parliament. Um, so one thing we could say is to what extent is the Scottish haulage industry today you know, vulnerable to competition from foreign hauliers? Um, uh, I mean, it's still possible for hauliers to fill their tanks outside the country and come into Scotland and you know, operate here with uh, lower operating costs. Um, what has happened in the meantime, however, and this is a Westminster-driven uh, directive, the, there's the HGV levy has been imposed, which has tried to level the fiscal playing field, if you like, between hauliers in the UK and, and those externally. Um, so although that was a big issue that was well debated at the time, uh, nothing very much happened because, as I say, the powers resided elsewhere. There were, there, I think there are 50 recommendations in the 2006 report, and I'm not going to go through all 50 to see whether or not they've been implemented or not. Um, in, in many cases, it's hard to know if they were implemented uh, because it involved asking the Scottish Government to conduct a study or, or, or to audit, and one doesn't know if that was done internally. Um, th there were a few things that have happened, however, which um, I suppose uh, were recommended. One is the increase in the speed limit for trucks on the A9. That was a recommendation. Uh, there was concern expressed about the state of the fourth road bridge. Um, the 2006 uh, committee report didn't actually ask for a second fourth crossing, uh, though there is one now being constructed. Um, there were some other things recommended. It's hard to judge if they have actually happened. If I just list a few of them, um, a suggestion that um, bridges should be strengthened in the highlands to um, uh, accommodate the 44-ton lorry, because I think there were many restrictions on the movement of heavy trucks in the highlands because uh, uh, the bridges hadn't been checked and strengthened to, to accommodate them. Um, there was suggestion that there, would be, there should be some investigation of the case for night delivery in urban areas in Scotland. Um, as far as I know, that hasn't happened, uh, though there have been initiatives south of the border uh, seeing what the potential is for um, delivering to shops in urban areas uh, during the night. Um, uh, there was support um, for the Rosyth uh, Zeebrugge Ferry. Um, now, you know, some of these things have been overtaken by events because, as I'm sure the committee is well aware, um, the SECA uh, regulations have imposed tighter environmental restrictions on uh, uh, short sea shipping, and uh, that has made the Rosyth uh, ferry a bit more precarious, though the um, Scottish Government, I think, has come in and provided uh, some financial assistance, which um, now makes that uh, 
service uh, viable again. Um, another recommendation in the committee by the committee was that more use be made of long distance rail freight services between Scotland and the European mainland through the Channel Tunnel. Uh, I, regrettably, I don't think that has happened. Uh, I, I, I think the uh, if you look at the total number of freight trains going through the Channel Tunnel today and compare that with what it was in 2006, uh, I think there are about a quarter fewer now than there were then. Now, I don't know how many of those are starting their journeys or ending them in Scotland, but um, th there's less use being made of the, the Channel Tunnel today than before. There was a recommendation that freight facilities grants be uh, encouraged um, to shift more freight from um, road to rail. Um, well, I mean, Scotland continues to make these grants available, unlike the government south of the border, uh, but I understand that today there are relatively few awards uh, made. Um, what has also happened in the meantime is the methodology that's used, I think, to award these grants has, uh, has changed. Um, I mean, the committee overall was keen to see a shift in freight from road to rail and water. Um, in the 2012 study that uh, Mai and I compiled for the Freight Transport Association, which has been submitted as evidence to the inquiry, um, we show how the freight model sh split has changed, and it's not changed very much in that time period. Uh, I mean, uh, the freight market is still overwhelmingly dominated by road transport here in Scotland, and there's been only a marginal shift to rail. Um, you know, one point I will make on, on freight model shift is that we tend to measure the allocation of freight between transport modes in weight terms. Um, and some of the traffic that the railways have recently secured is of low density freight um, that doesn't necessarily account for a lot of tons, but it does uh, take up quite a bit of volume on the, uh, on the trucks and the trains. Uh, so the, the lighter retail traffic that the railways have secured, again, it's traffic that's um, you know, it's, it's lucrative for the railways and it's something to be encouraged, um, but it doesn't actually add all that many tons to the rail network by comparison, for example, with coal or other primary products as well. Um, anyway, I could go on, but I, I don't want to bore you with all these details, but there, there's some um, indications of, of some of the changes that have occurred over the past uh, nine years or so. Uh, Professor McKinnon. Um, would you, how would you characterise then what the impact of the report has been overall? Is the situation improving or has it, um, are we going back the way? What, what's your sense of it? Um, I think it's mixed. Uh, I'm, I'm sure the committee back then would have liked to have seen a more pronounced shift of freight to, to rail into water. That really hasn't happened. Um, something I've not said anything about is, is aviation, so that um, air freight was declining up until uh, air freight out of Scottish airports was declining up to 2006, and that decline has continued. I think the freight tonnage going through Scotland's airports has dropped by a third um, today from what it was back in 2006. Um, uh, it, it, a, a number of very positive infrastructural things have happened in the interim. Um, I mean, the M74 extension has, uh, has been constructed, um, and that has relieved Scotland's main congestion bottleneck back then. Uh, we've also got the M77. So there are major road improvements which have had a, a big impact on, on freight movement um, in that time period. Uh, uh, we still have the Rosyth Ferry, you know, if uh, it hadn't been uh, supported, I suspect it may have uh, been discontinued by now. Um, uh, I mean, th there are some, some other trends which I maybe haven't mentioned. Take CO2 emissions. Um, again, I'm not sure how important that particular issue is to this inquiry, but um, uh, the study we did in 2012 suggested that uh, the carbon intensity of freight transport in Scotland, um, if anything, has declined slightly. Um, the actual total amount of CO2 emitted by freight transport had come down, but a lot of that was due to the economic conditions and the, uh, the recession of 2008 through to, to 10. Um, so so it, it's, it's hard to sum it up just in a few words. I mean, I think there's some things which are positive and have worked well. Um, other things which maybe haven't delivered the benefits that were expected, and other things it's very hard to say because, as I say, the recommendations were for internal measures by the Scottish Government, and it's hard for me to say whether or not they've actually been implemented. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm sure we'll tease out a number of these issues. Uh, my colleague Dave Stewart would like to ask a brief supplementary. 
thank you. I'm interested in the points that um, Professor McKinnon made about the HGV increase in speed in the A9. It's a cause close to my heart, and we discussed last night, in fact, at Mike McKenzie's uh, members' debate. Uh, one of the interesting issues raised uh, to me by the haulage industry is that if you actually raise HGV speeds on that uh, road, which I'm very familiar with, um, to 50 from 40, if you're actually you're using a higher gear, uh, you actually are less emitting than you would be at 40 miles an hour. So that links, I think, well with your point about CO2. And it can, it's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? You tend not to think that increased speed is less emitting. Um, and whatever, I'm obviously I'm very keen that we see freight moving on to water and to rail, but there will always be a very important role for road transportation. Uh, and it's one that I'm very enthusiastic about. So I'll make that one point. The other one is, I do believe in England they are looking at changes in the speed limit as well. And I was raising this with the Minister last night about whether there'd be some examples for the Scottish Government to look if they are looking at um, developing this pilot elsewhere. Yes, I mean, there is a, a sweet spot in, in terms of the speed of the vehicle where you minimise the amount of fuel consumption. Mm. Uh, it is true, and it's, it's somewhere between I mean, 45 and 60 miles mm. an hour you know, where you will minimise the, the speed, uh, minimise the, the, the fuel consumption and so the CO2. I mm. think also what you do is you improve the overall flow of all categories of traffic. Yes. Uh, and so probably the fuel efficiency of the cars will also improve as well. Mm. So there's a wider environmental and carbon benefit, it seems mm. to me. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for that. Perhaps I could ask um, Dr. Pierczek and Mr. Halden, um, in general terms, how would you describe the current infrastructure uh, surrounding the freight industry in Scotland? Um, oh, okay, I'll go. I, I, I'll, I'll go first. I mean, um, like Alan, um, I've been looking at you know this this type of agenda for for some years, and I was. Uh, looking at the trends looking forward as well because what we want to do with this inquiry hopefully is come up with good things that can happen in the future and there's four themes under which I think the infrastructure needs to recognise that change is needed I mean uh, uh, the, the, the well, first of these would be around the sort of customization theme, which is one of the big changes taking place in society. Now, looking back to a document I worked on, Roads, Bridges, Traffic and the Countryside in 1991, um, I remember we put forward there the creation of the idea of a freight network and if we had clearly defined freight networks what vehicles went on what roads uh, across Scotland then we wouldn't have any arguments about which roads should be 50 miles an hour for lorries and which weren't so that that level of clarity and a clear hierarchy within the road network I believe um, 24 years on is still just as needed as it was back then and is would, would be top of my list in terms of uh, the infrastructure so it's not you know whether that leads to actual physical changes or not um, inevitably it'll lead to some physical changes but I really don't think we know what they are and all we're doing is putting sticking plaster over wounds until we have some clarity that we're saying oh this is the road that we want the largest vehicles to go on and this is the consolidation hub that they will then reach and uh, transfer to a smaller vehicle and until we have that level of hierarchy in the network we, 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 we struggle and the second theme is is around efficiency that um, We've been uh, looking at sort of horizontal and vertical integration um, that we'd be trying to achieve with the customers of freight and the collaborators that, um, that, that we're trying to achieve. To, so, for example, uh, in terms of the horizontal integration, we're having two slightly different types of product travelling on the same vehicles to drive up efficiency. And again, we ask, how, what are we actually doing to deliver that sort of thing? Where's the infrastructure to support that type of uh, issue? And in terms of the vertical integration, how we're actually looking at what we buy and how we manage that, um, which is related to um, issues around um, the simplification of, of, of networks and business models. Um, Maybe watching what you mean by vertical integration. Uh, well, v vertical integration would, would mean that instead of a customer saying, I want to move 20 widgets from A to B at 9 in the morning, the freight supplier says, you know, we're actually taking a trip at 10 in the morning, so if you were to uh, allow us to move it at 10 in the morning, we can give you a better price. Um, so they collaborate with the purchaser um, and achieve some degree of, uh, of integration in the, in the approach they take to, to the way they buy things. 
things. Now, clearly, that's very important when talking to national government, as, as you are as a, as a committee, because national government's right at the top of that uh, hierarchy of, of, uh, uh, of, of, of purchasing and supply. So, um, in, in terms of the, the, the sort of business models, I'd be looking again at, at the sort of infrastructure business model. I mean, you know, there's lots of talk. Do, do we own more land, to, for example, around ports or airports to try and lever some of the benefits? One of the things that worries me most, I mean, a lot of our works in the land use transport inter interaction area, is that because policy often seems quite unstable, um, the people that make the biggest sums of money are the speculators. The people that think, oh, if I can lobby for this particular transport investment, then this bit of land we have there, we can make a few billion pounds on. And so actually, the more stability we can have within policy, and one way of creating, the reason Princess Street's there in Edinburgh is because somebody bought all the land and achieved the planning in that way because they controlled it through ownership. So there are different business models, some around ownership, but some are just around agreements, around what can happen in particular areas. So stability, is, you know, cer certainty is needed in, the, in, in there. That's probably enough. I've, I, I, like Alan, I could, I could go on for, for ages, but there's a lot in, a lot in that, so I'd better stop. Yeah. Well, you've got lots of opportunities this morning. Uh, Dr. Pircek. Uh, I agree with all the points. A uh, few things I would like to add on that, uh, onto that is uh, we need to integrate Scottish freight transport systems with the UK freight transport systems in general because it's a part of wider network. To make the whole system efficient, we need this whole system perspective. Scotland is only part of it and we need to look across the borders. So that's the main, uh, that's the first thing. The other thing is um, we also need, because Scotland doesn't have deep sea container ports, so if we want to maximize the potential for mode shift, we need to make sure we have efficient links by alternative transport modes to the main deep sea container ports in the south. So that's an important uh, issue as well. And the third thing um, links back to the land use planning and uh, freight movement in urban areas. With the recent trends in huge growth in online uh, retailing, we need uh, to understand the flows, freight flows generated by that, and we need infrastructure to make uh, home deliveries most efficient. So whether that's sort of unattended uh, collection points or uh, even loading base for uh, people delivering freight to homes, uh, we need to look into that. So we need to understand the nature of traffic flows in urban areas and provide uh, infrastructure uh, for the most efficient uh, solutions to, to that problem as well. Thank you. Mike, did you have a supplementary? Yes, it was just there. You, you mentioned that, you know, uh, our uh, strategy has to take account of the fact that we don't have a deep sea container port and y y I'm sure you're aware that there was a proposal a few years back to have just such a port at Hunterston. But um, do you feel that um, Scotland's um, freight strategy um, would benefit greatly in terms of maximising the economic benefit to Scotland if we did have a deep sea container port? <laughs> well, it's, there isn't a simple uh, answer to that. I think there is a need for a study uh, that would first assess the feasibility of having a deep sea container port. So do you have enough space and land around it? And the second thing is you would need to consult the main shipping line because Scotland is outside of the main shipping routes at the moment. So I don't know even if Scotland had a deep sea container port. It's the question of whether the main shipping line would actually use the port to deliver directly to Scotland, or they, would they rather stick to the Rotterdam uh, and south of England ports? Do you think there's virtue in us having a study to uh, examine this possibility? Uh, yeah, go on. <laughs> um, I should have mentioned this. Back in 2006, there were actually two proposals active for a deep sea container port. There was Hunterston, there was also Scapa Flow. And so the committee back then, uh, they didn't dismiss the idea, but I think they were a bit sceptical. Uh, partly for the reason that Maya mentioned, that what is the likelihood that a big um, deep sea container shipping line would actually call a, a report in Scotland? And even if they were to do so, given the traffic volumes, it would be infrequent. You know, so many Scottish exporters would probably still want to connect with the more frequent services that they would get through you know, Felix Store or Southampton. Um, I mean, Scotland is always going to have this problem in trying to develop direct links because we just don't generate a huge amount of traffic. Um, another problem, which I didn't mention, was, was the traffic imbalance problem. 
that you know, in, in all our transport modes, there's a directional imbalance in traffic, which makes it very difficult to get direct services into Scotland as well. So while it'd be great if it could be achieved, I think we've got to be realistic, and I, I just don't think it's, it's going to happen anytime soon. Yeah. Alden, do you have a view? Yeah, I mean, I, I, as, a, as a long, w these are discussions that I think I can remember um, Alf Baird and Alan and myself having in the Scottish Transport Studies Group 25 years ago. So I, I, I don't think it's a, a, a new um, a new issue. Uh, I think it would be lovely to take, you know, Al Alf Baird, who's been leading a lot of the charge on Scapa Flow and, and that sort of thing, uh, uh, strong arguments there around why should Scotland be worse served than Iceland when we've got a much better population. You know, if you actually look at the demand, could we create some sort of... Um, international terminal on the motorways of the sea perhaps and you know so yeah, yes I would just say it, it's something that does deserve more looking at it's, it's it is a tall order to deliver it. Dr Peercheck you said that um, Scotland has to be integrated within wider um, transport and freight networks perhaps the the panel could tell us whether they think that there are trends at a European and global level in terms of uh, freight and logistics that have an influence on the Scottish freight transport system? <laughs> Please. Um, yeah, I, I mean, one of the dominant trends in logistics for decades has been the centralisation of inventory. Um, and that's happened uh, you know, at a very advanced stage here in the UK, so that uh, um, Scotland gets a lot of its retail products from distribution centres in the Midlands of England for example. Um, we're also beginning to see that process at a continental level as, as um, companies move away from nationally based systems of distribution to pan-European systems of distribution. So, so this centralisation, uh, it, it applies to production, but, but also happens, to, it applies to inventory. And so we see big distribution centres serving wider and wider areas. Um, in the 2012 study we did for the Freight Transport Association, one thing we looked at was the development of distribution centres here in the UK. And uh, what that showed was that there was a relatively small amount of distribution centre development here in Scotland that, by comparison with the Midlands of England, for example. Um, so therefore there are heavy flows of product you know, from these centralised um, logistics centres down south uh, into Scotland uh, as, as well. And as I say, at, at a European level, this is also happening. This is one of the regrets that the Channel Tunnel um, is not being used for this purpose, uh, because the railways have a compar comparative advantage in long distance moving. Uh, so um, I think at the moment there are only is it eight freight trains a day go through the Channel Tunnel. I mean, this is the most amazing piece of infrastructure that we're underusing, and I would like to see more use made of uh, long distance rail connections into these more centralised production and warehousing facilities on the European mainland. We're going to come on to rail, don't worry. OK, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyone else? The wider I, trends I, impacting on, on Scotland? I, th I think there's a big um, resilience issue um, I, I, I mean, it's sort of, uh, uh, that's coming along, as well as the ones I've mentioned around efficiency and customisation. It's per perhaps the, the, the theme I've not, um, not touched on most. And one of the areas we'd see that is the last mile, where you know, companies um, uh, creating local drop-off points for, for parcels, and these also become, even like having a house in a street, as we're seeing in some, some areas where all the parcels go to and people get to know their neighbours better. And so there's a whole resilience issues about where we drop off. Local small businesses can drop off their parcels to get better value shipments, say you're um, a, small, a, a small artist materials shop on a high street. You can now get access to the supply chain enormously much more easily than you could a few years ago and, and what that then leads to in terms of this uh, hierarchy so I talked about the top-down hierarchy in terms of consolidation sectors and, and how government but actually but, but bottom up and actually making sure this is this is actually a, a big fast ch uh, changing area and as we move into more 3d printing for uh, you know parts or whatever we get to there's a, there's a, there are a lot of sort of uh, areas that you know local manufacturing and um, and onshoring is one of the big trends that we're observing actually instead of you know Alan's referring to the sort of what we used to do is offshore and have, you know, sort of get stuff from a few centres around the world. There is, the, the, that, that trend is changing and we're, and we're actually seeing for certain types of things, local manufacturing making much more um, competitive and, and, and some of that happening as well. So I think watching that space and ensuring that there are, you know, if we're coming on to funding mechanisms, funding mechanisms to support good things happening in that space is certainly something I think we could uh, talk about. 
Dr. Piercek, in terms of what we've just heard from Professor McKinnon and Mr. Halton, what, what do you see as being the, the threats and opportunities arising from these um, wider European and global trends? Well, one positive trend is uh, coming from all these things and also the pressure to, re to increase energy efficiency in everything we do, so including freight transport, is increasing proportion of freight operators uh, starting to collaborate. So they're looking be be beyond their own operational boundaries to combine, uh, to combine flows and making sure the resources are fully utilized in whenever they go. So instead of sending a truck full and coming back empty, they now uh, actively looking for something to take back. And that, uh, that, that's happening across all different transport modes. So that's a very positive development. It's the collaboration between companies. And there is a lot of research and a lot of projects going on in the UK and in Europe at the moment, looking at ways uh, of helping companies to do, to do just that. And it's not only looking for collaboration on full loads, it's also looking for opportunities to consolidate loads to make, the, uh, to make sure the trucks are full or to make sure we have enough volume to use alternative transport modes. So, um, so that's uh, one thing. The overall efficiency in freight transport systems in the UK and elsewhere is, uh, is increasing, and that's a very positive development. Um, in terms of threats, um, I think the challenge in Scotland is um, the imbalance in traffic flows. Uh, so because Scotland is not in a central position in Europe, as for example Germany, it's more difficult to balance out the traffic flow to and from uh, Scotland. And it's different at the UK level to what it's uh, between Scotland and the rest of Europe because we import we import more things from England that we send to England, but we export more to the rest of the world. Uh, than we than uh, we actually import, and so making sure uh, we balance out the use of uh, vehicles, trucks, trains, uh, and vessels, it's uh, it's quite important. To move on, Mary, you've got some questions. Yes, thank, thank you. you. I want you to explore a bit further the the, ob the infrastructure obstacles to the free flow of road, road freight specifically. Um, and a number of road improvements have already been done, um, and we are aware that, that further road improvements need to be done. Um, and I was, I was quite interested, um, Mr Halden, when you were talking about um, freight networks, a specific freight network, and again, Dr Piercek, you talked about integrated systems, because we've, concerns have been raised about the difference in speeds between Scotland and the rest of the UK, um, and also you talked about the imbalance of, of, of traffic flow. So could the panel identify any specific infrastructure obstacles that are severely impacting on the free flow of road, road freight, and what could be done to minimise that? Who would like to start? Okay, I, I, I'll kick off. Um, in, in, in the question, um, one of the first things I, I look at this concept of free flow. I mean, it's always a case of which came first, the chicken or the egg, because um, actually there'd be no flow or flow at all if we didn't have a road. And um, so this we, it was back to the theme of, of, of network coverage and, and what networks do we have? We can't have every part of every network offering unimpeded free travel. Apart from anything else, there would be no money to pay for the infrastructure that we needed. And um, so, so there need to be costs in the system somewhere. There need to be deterrence in the system somewhere. So the question is therefore what costs and what deterrence uh, do we put into the system and where? So where are the, the, is Scotland losing out? And, and for me this is a big theme about regional development. If I look at EU policy and say when we work on the European projects um, as opposed to UK ones, Europe's always saying, oh, Britain, UK, great at doing most things, but appalling at regional development, uh, something we know a lot about in Scotland. And it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the biggest areas of UK policy failure is regional development. And so I'd be saying when I look at 
the things we currently do, well, actually, can that business in the Western Isles or wherever thrive with the current networks we have? And so does the, net, the, the network coverage allow them to compete? And then we get into so many detailed issues, whether it be resilience and the rest and be thankful or ferries. I mean, you can go into hundreds of issues, but what, so rather than me focus on any specific infrastructure issue to give them, I wouldn't want to give the impression I'd done that work and therefore I was prioritising any individual one of these a higher than any other one of these. But what is clear is that we don't, we just not looked at the networks, and it's back to my very first point uh, back in 1991 saying we need to clarify um, uh, our, our freight networks, and we do need to clarify, and then we will say we target, you know, we, will, we, won't, we won't have congestion in these, we'll say, well, that's a, a target, we'll just make sure we manage the systems, because we do, we constantly manage demand in the systems to ensure that we achieve the target journey times. There's all sorts of things we can do to achieve that. We could have, um, one of our uh, road investigation pieces of work, yes, we've got the M74 Northern Extension, but when we were analysing that, we kind of looked, said, well, actually, we could close the motorway junctions in the centre of Glasgow, and then you'd get free flow in the M8 as it, as it stands. Now, obviously, that wasn't desirable, and it wasn't what we did, but there are lots of ways you can achieve free flow. They're not always publicly acceptable, and they're not always what we end up doing, but there are always, the, 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 you know, ma managing that free flow is absolutely what we need to be doing. Okay. okay. Mr. Mc Professor Back McKinnon. That, yeah. um, I, I think Scotland's Transport infrastructure, road and rail, is good. You know, if, if you look around the world, um, we, we are well endowed with a good infrastructure. Um, freight is not much obstructed uh, at present. Um, if you look back to the 2006 report, I think we quote a figure there that the average freight journey in Scotland, I think, was delayed by an average of six minutes. You know, um, we, we pulled together various numbers we could find at the time to come up with that figure. Uh, that, that is a pretty small delay. I think if you redid that calculation today, you'd find that figure was less, you know, because for the reason I mentioned, the M74 extension and the freeing up of traffic flows through Glasgow, I think, has, uh, has made uh, the, the life of the hollier a lot easier in Scotland. Um, I, I would say that the main infrastructure constraints in Scotland are outside Scotland. You know, it's, it's the connections with the airports down south, with, um, you know, destinations down south, with the ports down south, where Scottish vehicles get snarled up in congestion in the Midlands or the south of England, you know. So I think uh, that that's where there's more uh, of a, an infrastructural problem. Um, obviously, one could highlight a, a, a few bottlenecks. Uh, I mean, it's often said that the Cope Bridge Freightliner Terminal, for example, has rather poor access at the moment. And, and that's a, a, an important node, really, for getting Scotland's exports uh, down south. Um, I mean, clearly, for, for many years, we've been hoping that um, the... M8 would be three lanes the whole way between Glasgow and Edinburgh, and uh, you know, I'm sure that will happen eventually as well. But I, 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 like Derek, I, I wouldn't want to just give you a list of all the infrastructural improvements I think would be necessary. Uh, indeed, I don't really have that detailed knowledge to permit that. Um, just one other point I, I will make, too, is that when we're looking for ways of facilitating freight movement, it's not necessarily by construction, by, you know, expanding the network, one can use all sorts of clever means these days to use the existing network more efficiently and effectively with advanced traffic management systems, for example. Um, and that can benefit freight traffic, it seems to me. If you look at the ATM, the advanced traffic management systems used by the highway agency down south, uh, it shows that freight has benefited a lot from, from those initiatives without necessarily adding extra lanes or building new road links. And moving the focus off specifically freight and looking at how we improve our roads in general and, in, and it comes back to the point Mr Haldin you made about improving free flow the knock-on effect is it improves freight exactly exactly that, that's very true and I mean trucks I think are only the HGVs are only about six percent of the traffic on Scotland's roads and that percentage has actually been has dropped since 2006 uh, but of course trucks are bigger so you often use a uh, as a weighting factor, saying a truck is maybe the equivalent to two and a half cars. And if you applied that, then your trucks would be maybe 13 or 14 percent of the traffic in Scotland. But I often say that trucks are the victim of traffic congestion rather than the cause of it, right? But, uh, which endears me to the road haulage industry. <laughs> yes. Okay. Dr. <laughs> yeah. Uh The only point I have to add on everything that's been said is it's not only the effective traffic management, it's also the policy measures and things like access restriction of encouraging more freight being moved um, in off-peak hours or so nighttime deliveries. 
looking at ways to deliver to uh, retail units, for example, at night time or outside the main, mm -hmm. uh, trying to smooth the level of traffic throughout the day. On and talking a bit more detail about policy and, and regulation, um, and again it was mentioned in a previous um, answer about the last mile, because we have heard in previous evidence sessions the importance of that last mile. Um, could you give us a bit more information on how important you think the last mile is and what could be done to improve that last mile? Well, I think the last mile is a growing problem. Uh, so in, uh, with increasing proportion of the population living in urban areas uh, and uh, increase in online retailing, the, obviously the last mile problem uh, becomes uh, quite important. And the key challenge is the challenge of failed deliveries. So if you have to, if you have to re deliver a number of times, then you significantly increase the carbon uh, footprint associated with that delivery. Um, but it's not only the uh, business to customer side, it's also business to business delivering to the retail units mm -hmm. and uh, the consequences of the changing uh, character of UK high streets. So we're, moving, we're increasingly moving away from main uh, retail towards coffee shops and uh, uh, coffee shops and sort of meeting points, this sort of thing. So the nature of freight uh, flows in urban areas is changing, um, and that uh, that generates a need for uh, different solutions to, to to look at just that. So there is a number of urban logistics projects going on uh, in UK and in Europe, and they're looking at different solutions. So there are things as, for example, urban consolidation centres. And we have an event uh, planned uh, together with Tactrand and Transport Scotland at Harriot Watt uh, on the 17th of June. Uh, we have an event uh, looking at the success stories with applying the urban consolidation centers. Uh, uh, so that's one of the solutions. The other is the potential of using electric vehicles to reduce the air pollution and carbon emission, particularly if we can power them from uh, uh, decarbonized energy sources. Uh, the common theme amongst all of this, they need to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis, so there is no a single solution that will work for er every city and every urban area. There may be a mix of measures that will be required to, uh, to deliver the most effective uh, uh, bundle of things for this particular place, but uh, there's a lot of work going on and there are opportunities out there. I tend to, in my, my head, when we talk about the last mile, I think about um, the last mile being the last mile to a container depot or a freight hub or the last mile that can connect the train mm. and not think so much mm. about locally and, and urban areas and how that last mile is, is so important. It's, it's a good point. The, the, the term is defined mm -hmm. differently. Yeah. Um, I suppose in, in the academic circles these days, we tend to think of the last mile as being the last link in the supply chain to the home, which is being affected by online retailing. But you're right, it can also relate to feeder movements into ports and, uh, and railways. Yeah, that, that's very true. Um, yeah, uh, th this is an area where I've done quite a bit of work over the years, and particularly around the town centres, and you know, actually it's the last two miles, um, which is accounts for a huge amount of of travel, um, and looking at how to optimise that, uh, you know, whether it's the person walking to the shops or the, the you know, because some of those small failing stores around Scotland that have been like a wee news agent that's uh, become the local pick up and drop off point. This has underpinned the entire viability of high street stores. There's a, a broader social and economic agenda around how we get this right. I mean, even at the most extreme end, we've seen there's actually been an explosion and there's now dozens of companies around the country setting up just with local volunteers getting out on their bike and doing local freight deliveries from these places to people that maybe can't get out and walk, for, you know, the, the, the two miles. So, I mean, actually, there, 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 there's lots of stuff on there that's about jobs and regeneration and, and, and good stuff going on there. But I think we need to look at why some of this doesn't happen. And, you know, you mentioned tax and I think that the, 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 there's a lot to be learned there from why their consolidation project didn't work. Um, I mean, I mean, 
and, and, and of what di- because as, as it were, you look at what didn't work, what were the barriers and what did work, and this sort of thing, and actually look at the different things. Because this is one of the issues, I mean, Transport for London, remember we, we, we were doing some work with British Council and the shopping centres and working with them on the consolidation centres in London and, and looking at where these go. And one of the big issues, you know, the shopping centre industry was saying, well, there they are where our shopping centres are. That's your consolidation centre points. And you can actually, they've got the uh, handling facilities, they, they, they can handle uh, stuff. What do we need other than a partnership between um, our, our shopping centre industry and, 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 and government? But that didn't meet with the procurement practices in, in Perth and Kinross Council. So they didn't, weren't able to follow that through. I think sometimes uh, that might or might not be the, ro- the right answer. But I think actually just looking at some of the issues that might be acting as barriers to us achieving, you know, we might have the consolidation centres might be out there around Scotland anyway with the facilities there to do it. It's just a case of formally recognising it and supporting it and endorsing it. So that, uh, a couple of different angles on the local, on the local issue around that how we handle that last mile, two miles, differently. Yeah. And there's not one solution to fit everywhere. Mm-hmm. Can I make a point there? I mean, I'm based largely in Germany these days. Um, in Germany, the main postal service, the Deutsche Post, um, have um, established 3,000 pack stations. So these are like locker banks, automated locker banks, where people can go and collect online orders. Uh, so there's now a pack station within 10 minutes of everybody in Germany. So that's an infrastructure that's been created over the past seven or eight years um, you know, with the purpose of trying to rationalise last mile delivery. So it doesn't have to be to the home anymore. It can be to a local pack station. Um, that in the UK, we haven't seen a similar development, uh, although picking up on the point that Derek made, uh, I think there are now... 25,000 collection points in the UK, which are shops, post offices, community centres. You know, so we're using, in a sense, our existing infrastructure without having to build this new network of, uh, of locker banks for, for online delivery. And, and railway stations. And railway stations, yes. I mean, yes, I mean, Transport for London found that something like 25% of all deliveries to the front desk of their, of their office was uh, staff uh, getting the things they bought online delivered to the office you know it was actually nothing to do with the business of dfl and they're thinking well if this affects our staff as a big employer in london it must affect everybody else that's out there so they as a transport employer therefore said well let's create a network and they what do we have control railway stations they've created around railway stations what could we be doing around particular at this point with abelio trying to make commitments around our railway stations in scotland and greater community focus can we make them more of hubs there's opportunities there too so one thing that worries me, incidentally, in this area, you hear about the Internet of Things, how in the future all our appliances will be collected to the Internet. Um, and that may result in autom- automated replenishment. So your fridge will check you know, when it needs to get additional yogurt, and there'll be an automatic system to order fresh supplies. And that can be abused. You know, if people then get very frequent deliveries of small quantities just to top up the products that they have in their, their home. I think we have to be very careful that we don't let this get out of hand. Yep. Okay. Okay. Can I finally ask then about policy and regulation? Are there any obstacles in current policy and regulation that, that impede free flow of, of road freight and what could be done to make it better? Um, we have a, a very liberal regime here in the UK. I mean, we, we've had... Uh, um, Quantity licensing was removed from trucking in the UK in 1970. Uh, it's one of the most liberal systems in, in the world. Um, uh, obviously, to some extent, we, we inherit regulations from the European Commission, right? Uh, but um, it, I'm hard-pressed to say there's anything, I would say, any regulatory control which is obstructing the movement of freight. I will mention one thing, however, uh, relating to construction and use regulations. Um, I happen to be a supporter of an increase in in the maximum size and weight of trucks. Uh, I think that that yields economic and environmental benefits. Um, Now, in the UK, uh, we are trialling longer semi-trailers, and that's just a 10-year trial. Um, But in other countries, uh, in Scandinavia, in in, in the Netherlands, in in, in Germany, they're also trialling it, are are longer vehicles, 25-metre-long vehicles, which can go up to... 50 tonnes, 60 tonnes. Uh, now, the rail, we see that as very threatening. Um, but, you know, th- there's a lot of freight which 
is never going to go by rail. And I, I think what we should be doing is to try to do what we can to rationalise the road freight system. And it seems to me some relaxation in the size and weight of trucks would be beneficial. And one sector in Scotland that would benefit a lot from that is the timber sector. And we could even limit that relaxation to specific routes which would yield environmental and economic benefits. And remember, the Scottish timber industry is competing with the similar industries in Finland and in Sweden, where they can run trucks up to 30 metres and 74 tonnes. So that's something. Specific were given, for example, for, for timber, that would benefit. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that would be my point. Yeah. Can, can I just um, um, add to that? Because while I agree with Alan that there is... Is, is, is no major regulatory barriers. The barriers that come are largely because some people object. Now, so if we take one we've been talking about, which has been uh, like, what do we regulate the speed limit at in the A9? One of the reasons why that doesn't happen, and we don't put the, free, the speed limit up for lorries 20 years ago when, <laughs> or whenever, is because lots of people object and say, but this will de devastate the market for rail freight. And perhaps it will, because if road freight then becomes more competitive, then rail freight becomes relatively less competitive. But that doesn't need to be a barrier. It just means that part of the consequences of improving the efficiency of the economy are that you need to give bigger support to the other things. It's like an environmental economy, you know, it's a consequence of the decision you're making. So rather than say this is an un, it's not an unmanageable consequence, it's entirely a manageable consequence. So instead of chasing the lowest common denominator, which we often seem to do, or we can't do this because they'll object, what we can do is chase something that everybody can agree to, and that's what does it take to get support from the rail freight to increasing the speed limit on, on, on the A9. So just to use that as analogy, so it's not about regulation, it's back to partnership building, and these partnerships are about tough negotiations negotiations and hard cash, not sitting round tables um, uh, tr tr trying to pretend all of this is, this is cosy. This is, you know, how much cash does it take to ensure that, that uh, the disadvantage is mitigated and, um, and who's going to pay for it? And uh, so, so, you know, ma managing that partnership structure is, you know, real hard business negotiations and the sort of thing, I mean, I alluded to um, uh, uh, WH Malcolm Elker, but, you know, DHL or Norbert Dontes Uncle or all the third party logistics providers are getting better and better at trying to close more of these things by ensuring that all the cross-trading goes on and they can become genuinely um, cross-modal providers. Uh, I think we need to remember that we do have a capacity out there that it's not that government has to go and speak to every individual operator. Uh, that there, 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 are, there, there, there are ways that the industry is increasingly working better together than far better than it was 20 years ago um, uh, when it was so fragmented. It was, it was a, a, almost difficult to do good things. <laughs> Can I add something on, on light yes, delivery? Because, um, uh, again, it would be desirable, I think, certainly in urban areas, to have more product delivered in the evening or during the night. Um, and, and trucks are a lot quieter now than they used to be. So I, I think the environmental objections are, 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 are gone. Um, and this was something, remember, the inquiry did recommend back in 2006, and it hasn't happened, as far as I'm aware, to any great extent in Scotland. Naively, I think, back then, we thought that the night restrictions were zonal, right? But when we investigated it, we discovered that a lot of the restrictions on deliveries in urban areas are site-specific. It's when a, a supermarket got its planning permission, built into that permission was the restriction on the... Um, so it, it's actually, it, it's a bit more of a bureaucratic process than you might think. You'd have to get the night restrictions, night, night delivery restrictions um, relaxed, you know, site by site. But I think it's something worth doing. Because, I mean, the research that's been done down south suggests that there are environmental and um, congestion benefits and, uh, and economic benefits from doing that. So, so that's one regulation we could, maybe could look at. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Halden, going back to something you said earlier, can you just explain, um, for the benefit of the committee, what is an urban consolidation centre and which parts of Scotland are you thinking of? Each urban area... Um, we, we, we can't take the 40 ton juggernaut to the door of many shops. So what we need are the right type of vehicle on the right type of road. So uh, uh, where do we need the white van? 
where do we need um, smaller trucks, how do we consolidate loads so that different companies can have pallets all going on, 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 on a common large vehicle or a train uh, from a consolidation centre. So if we, just think, if we were to try and say, could we identify across Scotland in every city that what this network of freight consolidation centres looked like, then that would be a worthy outcome to the goal that I wrote in the document 24 years ago, <laughs> and I'm sure people before me had done many times. It's something that we've been trying to do but just haven't achieved, that we need this hierarchy with nodes and links, and if we do that, we can uh, serious. It's not something the industry can do by itself. It involves so many issues, the planning issues, the organisational issues, that if we were to establish that clarity, perhaps even use public purchasing power to buy some land, but actually probably might find the land's there and it's by partnering and this sort of thing. But if we were to just identify these nodes, preferably rail connected nodes around, around the country and say, this is this is what the, the consolidation centre look like for Edinburgh or Perth or Dundee or whatever, then then we can dramatically Im, Im, reduce the, 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 the large vehicles uh, going right into the heart of the, the city centres. Dave, you have some questions. Uh, thank you. Um, are freight grant schemes working in your experience? I think they have worked well in the past. Um, I don't think there's sufficient uptake anymore. I mean, I, I did check. I, I think is that four million pounds have been allocated to the freight facilities grant for this year. But I think in recent years it's it's been underspent. Um, now, now you you could take the view that all the low low hanging fruit has been harvested. That because these schemes have been in place since the uh, mid 70s. Um, and in that time, I, I mean, they have helped to divert a lot of freight onto onto rail and, and uh, the number of truck kilometres have reduced quite substantially. Um, but it, it may be that there are just few opportunities now for the use of these grants. Um, uh, I, I don't think the, the problem is so much the application process, because I think that has been facilitated over the years. It may just be that um, you know we've exhausted all the obvious uh, opportunities for, for applying these grants. Um, I mean, you're, you're, you're right on the freight facilities grant, but it's more than mm -hmm. underspent. It hasn't been spent at all since mm -hmm. 2011, yes. which, yes. Um, you know, it was obviously quite worrying. I, I mean, in terms of, in fairness, though, I would say that, um, and your point about timber, the, if you look at Waterborne Freight Grant, uh, Boyd Brothers in Corpa got nearly a, a million pounds to take timber off the road on, uh, onto sea, which is obviously very positive. Um, certainly our experience talking to, like, the port operators um, would suggest that it's actually quite a tricky and uh, complicated experience. I think, if I remember correctly, Convener Montrose, um, Chief Executive, uh, was the last port to get Freight Facilities Grant before 2011, but they actually employed a consultant to make sure all the boxes were ticked. So it does appear to me there's maybe some barriers there. We, we have been involved in preparing facilities grants and it's it's not it's not an unduly onerous process i think the issue is what i was alluding to earlier that it's the is the criteria are perhaps not broad enough that the environment is not the only market failure in the freight transport industry. There are a whole range of social and environmental, you know, we're just looking at one wee bit with emissions there and saying that's the only market failure. So the regional development focus was the most obvious one I was concentrating on there that I think we need something like a freight investment fund or um, something like that, a renaming, a repackaging of it as something much more useful. And uh, so, yes, it's good that I think I think more, the reason reason we kept it in Scotland, if I had to observe as a sort of consultant looking in on the machinery, is because people didn't want to lose the money, not because they particularly felt that there was anything. They felt there was a need for something like that, um, but actually it was important to recognise it, but not that they thought the scheme as it stood was brilliant, <laughs> because the current rules are really quite restrictive about um, uh, just mm. specific emissions and specific trips. Mm. And again, sort of my experience in the past, putting some questions down on memory, um, is that uh, the, the schemes were more successful for rail than for sea. In fact, um, I haven't got specific information in front of me, but certainly in questions in the past, uh, there was very few for, for sea. It was mostly about rail. Is that your ex experience as well? Yes. In terms of rail? Yes. 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 I, I think um, the, the type of freight facilities grant in the past which worked quite well was where it was to 
um, a dedicated installation, like a factory or a warehouse, operated by one company, and they had quite a good idea of, of how much freight would be generated years into the future. You know, so you could see what the stream of benefits would be. Um, what is more difficult is if it's a, a logistics provider that is applying for a grant for an intermodal facility, mm. when they're not all that sure about who their future clients will be, mm. you know, what the volume of business will be years. And, and so it's, it's much, I think, harder to meet the requirements of the application where you cannot come up with these fairly firm predictions as to what the use of that facility will actually be. And of course, in Scotland, we've had some examples of freight facilities grants which have not delivered the benefits that were expected of them. Mm. You know, I think in Grangemouth, for example, I think the largest ever freight facilities grant um, didn't generate anything like the traffic for rail that was anticipated. And so <clears throat> could you put your finger on why that was the case? Uh, just the company changed its strategy. Um, this was, I think, when BP was operating out of, uh, mm. uh, so, yeah, um, ob obviously there's a certain risk, you know, and, and there's always a possibility that, that the client will change the logistic strategy or the ownership mm. of the business will change, mm. and, and therefore you may not, and I think I'm right in saying that no money has ever been clawed back mm. by, the, by the public sector, you know, mm. so they, 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 they take the risk and the danger mm. is the money then is, is uh, misused. Mm. But um, obviously our inquiry is about freight rather than climate change, but clearly that is a, that is a factor. And obviously I think we're all mm -hmm. concerned that you know, we're not meeting our climate change targets, and clearly transport yes. is, a, is a big emitter, uh, notwithstanding my point earlier about 50 miles an hour increase in speed. Yes. So clearly this makes a lot of sense to government to try and push uh, yes. freight off-road onto rail and onto sea. Yes. So, so basically you've t all the witnesses I think have hinted about this. How can we improve uh, the schemes that we currently have? Well, a lot of this isn't actually about big sums of money, but just enough money. Um, this is about the government's role as an organiser and facilitator to enable good partnerships to happen. And that's the bit that seems above all else to be, to be missing to me. I mean, we need, in many areas, when you look at the changes going on in the world, something like step changes in for infrastructure investment to rebuild our cities, the smart cities of the future and all this. I mean, they're really exciting things. I mean, whether it's stocking fridges or not, I don't know. But we, I don't think anyone does. But, 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 but what we need is to tap into those. And actually, government can share in the revenue streams by maybe carrying some of the non-market risks up front as well. So that, you know, the part the, the linked with the question about clawing back um, clawing back the money. I mean, the clawback should be linked with the whole delivery of the process. So I think it's how we use the funds we've got, how we partner, how we facilitate these types of project and, and enable them to succeed is what the future's about. And that, you know, is it, 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 certainty above all else. I mean, you know, if we look at even some of the schemes in the national planning framework, you know, oh, this is a, a certainty for 30 years, but some were changed within weeks. Now, the thing is, if I was an investor and I decided, committed to a billion in land value uplift because I thought, oh, well, we're going to get that road scheme or that railway scheme or something, and then we lose that certainty after a week. The reason why we're short of money in transport is because government keeps changing its mind about what it's going to do. The more certainty we have, there's a common theme I keep coming back to, is it's not about the actual cash, it's about the certainty about what's going to happen. Uh, that, that, unlet, that then unlocks the cash. And the um, port operators, you may have picked up the evidence we took um, recently, uh, the points they're making informally when we visited Grangemouth and Aberdeen and so on, and in witness sessions, where, look, you have very few constraints by sea. I mean, the, the constraints, if you take an area, hands and hands that I cover, the constraints by rail, unfortunately, are height restrictions. The fact that so much of the rail network is single track, um, that is what's stopping the flexibility. While there, plus, of course, there are some constraints by sea, there's not the same constraints. Would you agree that's a, a general thrust? I, 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 absolutely. I mean, those are expensive constraints to overcome, and you know, we, we need good volume, we need big volume increases on the railway networks to make sure they're properly justified, but we don't even go, you know, even the West Coast Main Line's not free of, <laughs> you yeah. know, the, well, there's stuff that's even more obvious than that, so yes, absolutely, we need to resolve some of these rail um, ga gauge issues. Well, do any other witnesses have any other comments on uh, you, you mentioned um, climate change and decarbonising mm. freight transport. One thing we have to do is, is to look at the relative cost effectiveness of all the ways in which we can do that through public intervention. 
Um, and the focus here has been on grants to support modal shift. Mm. But that's only one of a whole panoply of things that you could deploy mm. to try to decarbonise freight transport in Scotland. Um, one of my big disappointments in the UK is that uh, both in Westminster and also in Scotland, uh, the, the Freight Best Practice pro programme was abandoned, mm. um, which was designed to advise companies on how they could operate mm. their vehicles more energy efficiently. Um, the UK pioneered this. The UK was the first uh, country in the world um, to have these green freight initiatives. This was way mm. back in the 1990s. We abandoned ours, but they're now proliferating around the world. So in the mm. States, mm. the US, there's, there's a Smartway program. <coughs> in, in the rest of Europe, there's a Green Freight Europe. Um, there is um, Green Freight China, Green Freight India. Mm. Um, and I think the time has, has, has come to go back and, and mm. look again at the cost effectiveness of these programs which provide advice and guidance to, to companies. It, it, they also include things like driver training. I mean, training drivers to drive trucks more fuel efficiently is, is about the, quicker, the cheapest way in which you can cut CO2 emissions in, in the freight sector. So, so if I'm, I'm simply saying I'm not against freight grants, and, and I think they're, they're to be encouraged, but it's only one policy instrument, and there are lots of other ones I think that have to be considered as well. It's not for the first time predicted my next question about best practice okay. across the world. Yep. Unless you've already provided it to the clerks, would you perhaps give the committee clerks some information about this best practice? Because I wasn't particularly aware of that. I'm sure other committee members would Certainly. find that, that Certainly. very yes. useful. We'll do. do any other witnesses have examples of best practice across the world that's beyond just the basic freight facility grant uh, that we could perhaps look at as an exemplar of best practice? I, th I think there should be real encouragement for um, the sort of benchmarking clubs that, um, I mean, like Logmark, that um, Charging of Logistics and Transport runs, has really helped companies to say, why are we using 20% more fuel on similar operations to another company? And so actually just constantly benchmarking performance, it creates competition in the market that helps everyone do better. And I think that type of um, uh, uh, thing I'd probably add to what, what, what Alan's saying as well. The first one is um, CLT and the Freight Transport Associations are quite active on that. The Freight Transport Association has a low carbon, uh, lo low car logistics carbon reduction scheme, which is a group of companies interested in reducing emissions from their logistics activities. Uh, and they, uh, they also have annual awards for most uh, fuel efficient operators, so they have a number of categories. One is excellence in model shift, one is for most fuel efficient uh, mm, operation. So they benchmark the members uh, and they also give them uh, awards every year to encourage uh, positive uh, developments in the sector. Uh, the other thing, going back to uh, the freight uh, grant schemes, um, Model shift is an important, it's clearly an important issue and we clearly want to encourage more movements of freight by uh, more sustainable modes, whether it's a water or rail freight. But the road transport remains the key transport mode in the UK and this is unlikely to change in the future. So we really need to look at ways to decarbonize movements of freight by road. And one thing we're doing at Harriot Watt at the moment is we um, uh, we were commissioned by the Committee on Climate Change to produce a report on the likely um, on the ways to decarbonize road freight transport in the UK. We're looking at the period for the fifth carbon budget, which is 2027-2035, and the report should be out in about a month or so, and that will give you an indication of the most cost-efficient ways to decarbonize <coughs> freight, uh, road freight transport as well. Uh, yeah. in that study. Um, uh, th thank you, convener. That's all my questions. Mary. Thank you, um, convener. And following on from my earlier questions about free flow of road freight, I want to ask the panel about free flow of rail freight. Um, and we've heard in previous evidence sessions problems with loading gauge restrictions, with um, not long enough passing um, loops, um, lack of double tracking. Um, so specifically, what, what infrastructure obstacles do you see to the, the free flow of, of rail freight and, and also in, in the link of rail freight to road and sea and what can be done to overcome those obstacles? I, I, I'll keep up on that. Um, 
I, I don't think I can personally add, um, in terms of detailed projects, the very detailed evidence mm -hmm. that you'll have had from others like the Rail Freight Group, and the, you know, in terms of all the, the individual detailed pro projects. What, what, the, the test that I would apply is the one that, if we were, because we didn't have um, uh, for effectively the right gauge to Inverness, let's say, and we couldn't get, that railway line was about to close, uh, because we could no longer say, or like some have argued, we shouldn't really in Scotland have rail services north of Perth uh, and Dundee. That actually we're just going to, you know, sort of north north of Perth is actually all going to be loss making. Or certainly, you know, the, 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 these are some ec economists would take that thing. Now, if if that if that would sound fantastical to you, say we would never do that. Then now is the time to act, because as it were, what you don't do is leave up political mop-up that costs hundreds of millions to something that can be prevented with a few million now. And that's the way I would look at it in terms of we need a, a clear planned decision about what sort of rail network coverage we want in Scotland. We want railway lines going to Kyle of Lacalche and Wick and stuff like this because that's what, as a country, Scotland wants. Then we need to work out how to make the best use of that resource and how to add value to that resource to make sure that what's a very expensive resource is as well used as possible. I mean, you know, I think that's what uh, um, uh, you know. Certainly, the team at High Trans have been trying to do as much as possible. And so there's a, a lot of work going on there. But you think, you know, if if we've got that clear decision, so it's a back to this thing about networks. We need to define what sort of network coverage do we as a country need, and then once we've got that network coverage, what it looks like, where are the hubs, what types of networks, is it motorway, is it blue line stuff, is it dual carriageway, is it um, uh, and the character of, 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 you know, so actually we need to, we need clarity. I mean, this, you know, I think it had to be a political intervention to say, which cities do we have dual carriageways from? I mean, that's dreadful. You know, that actually that should be coming through, I th argue, a normal transport planning process that says, what should our networks look like? So, so there, are, there are actually some very important gaps here in Scottish um, transport that we don't know. We haven't even made up our mind where we want our, what, what we want to be blue lines. We haven't even got blue line between Glasgow and Edinburgh. You know, it's one of the most, and Alan's talking about three lanes, you know, but I, I'm actually highlighting, you know, so, I mean, you know if, if I was from Hong Kong or, uh, or, 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 or North America, look and say, what is this tin pot country? They haven't even got a motorway between the two major cities. You know, the, the, and I think we need to look at that sort of thing. And people might say they might not want to use the railway network immediately, but what's the option value of actually having that there to the country? And so I think defining that, making sure we're investing in it. So the detailed schemes, do we spend money on any individual? Yes, let's look at all the stuff that's out there, the people at the Rail Freight Group and put forward and stuff like this, and start to try and prioritise that and say, this is how we develop our network uh, in a planned, organised way. Everything's far too fragmented at the minute. And, uh, so we'd be better looking at what we want, deciding what we want and working back the way, rather than doing little bits of stuff to get us to somewhere that we've not actually defined. Absolutely. That's a really good way, I think, of putting what uh, the policy... Do there was a brilliant policy document produced by Scottish Government called Travel Choices for Scotland back in about 2000. And it started out, the very first line, and it was saying things like, in the future, our transport policy will be what sort of Scotland we want, not patching piecework, piecemeal mm -hmm. stuff around the networks. Absolutely, that's, that, that's where I'd be coming from and saying, you know, we, we, need, we need to get back to that sort of strategic focus and make, make decisions about what the country needs. Okay. Professor McKinnon. I, I don't have a sufficiently detailed knowledge of the Scottish Rail Network to sort of pinpoint areas where the loading gauge could be increased or, mm. or the passing loops extended. Um, but what I would do is, is suggest that we have to take a step back and say what is constraining greater use of the rail network in Scotland mm. by freight. Um, <laughs> and infrastructure is part of the problem, but it's not the only cause of, of, of this. Mm. Um, and and I, I cite the case of the gauge enhancement on the line, I think, from Dundee to Aberdeen and to Elgin, mm. which was you know, quite expensive. And um, as far as I'm aware, little use has been made of that. You know, so what we need is um, the railways perhaps be a bit more entrepreneurial, you know, to improve service quality, to provide a more competitive service, right? Uh, so, so merely releasing an infrastructural blockage often isn't enough. You've got to look at how the railways are actually going to exploit that as well. Back to the point, Mr. Halden, that you made about partnership negotiations. It's not just about different freight organisers or companies talking to each other. 
It's also about government talking to freight companies to say, if we do this, will you use it? Yeah. And if you're not going to use it, why, why not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the risk sharing in all yeah. of these agreements is absolutely critical. And it's one reason why I'm often quite critical of grant schemes. Because if we look at what often we give the grants to the worst performer, mm. where the way that markets work generally is the best performer does best. Mm. So often government acts in anti-competitive ways through grant schemes to support the worst performance and supporting the worst performers actually undermines the successful businesses and helps the unsuccessful ones to do better, mm -hmm. which is not always the, yeah. a good strategy. Um. <laughs> In favour of markets. Um, Dr. Piercek, do you have anything to add? No, I, I fully agree with Alan. We, we need to understand why the railway network is not being used to the extent it should be used to and then work from there. So taking a view of uh, rail freight providers and also potential rail freight mm. users is important part mm. of the process. And do, do we have enough terminals, hubs? Do we need, do we need to build more terminals or is, do what, what, we ha what we have, is that sufficient? Uh, it's often said, taking a UK perspective on this, that mm. um, th there is a, a lack of rail freight terminals, uh, but not so much in Scotland, it's more down south. I mm. mean, there's been a lack of such terminals in the London area, for example, um, and, and that's constraining the long haul movement of freight by mm. rail from Scotland down south uh, as, as well. But um, I, I think, I know there are studies been done on this and dry ports and yeah, your advisor I know has done work in this area. Um, I, I, I think personally we, we've probably got enough terminal capacity. I did mention earlier the importance of the Freightliner terminal in Cope Bridge, where I think local access is an issue um, there. But uh, yeah, overall I think um, there's, I, I can't see an obvious need for a, a big new terminal anywhere. Yeah. From a policy and regulation point of view, is there anything else that, that, that government could or should be doing, or does it come back to the points that were previously made about having that strategic vision <coughs> and, call, and, and partner negotiation and, and closely working together? To pick up on, on the Chair's point about markets, markets are often misunderstood. They're actually very simple, and the rules under which they operate are those defined by government. So if you don't like what you see in the markets, then that's a function of the regulatory rules that you have created um, that define what that market is. I'd love to see some of the markets incentivised more in social, particularly social, uh, there's been a focus on environmental, but particularly social directions, um, uh, and, 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 and that can be done through regulation um, in, in, in lots of ways. Um, uh, so, so I think some of the things I've hinted at, like, changing freight facilities grant into freight investment funds, partnership approaches, working together, addressing the wider social and economic issues, as well as just this environmental versus economy type war, that kind of people time to characterise, that I think the, 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 the social dimension is so often missing from what we're doing. And actually, when we unlock it, we see all these great things like the hundreds of extra businesses I'm talking about in the towns. And they are the things that really excite me and this whole agenda of what we can do. How do we unlock the potential? Um, and and that, so the question about what is the regulation? Yes, yeah, sort of regulation. It's also about how, how funds are managed and, and uh, partnerships are built. Um, um, uh, and what's the regulatory framework within which they operate. Like, for example, I always argued that the regional transport partnerships ceased to become partnerships the minute they were made statutory. If you look back to my response to the consultation on that 15 years ago, that was my argument then uh, as one of the people involved in setting up Sestran, <laughs> uh, that they cease to function. They know it's not a partnership if it's, if it's statutory. It's the, 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 each, each partnership has to have a, um, a project-based delivery focus, and partnerships are absolutely critical. But the minute you try and create a new organisation, it then ceases to be a partnership. <laughs> and, and, and so I think, I think that you're just addressing... So perhaps hinting at you know, all the good stuff the regional transport partnerships are doing and saying, well, perhaps, what does that partnership look like? and if we regulate it slightly differently. And that, I think that, um, without doing that exercise, because I'm not trying to say I've got all the solutions in there, I'm just saying some, there's maybe some space in there to think about how we, how we create those partnerships. So maybe more of a refresh of how policy is done and how we view what we could potentially do rather than actually change anything? Yeah, I would, st I, would st I would start by taking stock on what we're doing well and try and uh -huh. do more of it than try and say, and let's just do it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay. 
Professor McKinnon. Um, just returning to what I mentioned earlier about taking a European perspective on this. I mean, so the European Commission in its 2011 white paper came up with this very ambitious target to get 30% of freight moving more than 300 kilometres onto the rail or waterway network by 2030, right? Which would fundamentally re-engineer the modal split across Europe, right? Um, and what it's doing is it's established nine corridors um, and it's focusing its attention on shifting freight on those corridors. Now, Scotland, unfortunately, doesn't connect into any of those nine corridors, right? But the railways have a comparative advantage in long-haul movement, right? Um, and I find it remarkable that almost over 20 years we've had the Channel Tunnel and still we have very little freight from Scotland going into mainland Europe by rail, right? Um, so we, we just have to return to that subject. I, I was actually in a a committee that was set up um, in 1988, before the Channel Tunnel opened, uh, which looked at the ways in which Scotland could maximise the benefit it derived from the Channel Tunnel, both on passenger and freight. And if you look at the projections we made back then of the amount of freight from Scotland that would go through the tunnel, none of those have actually come into, have actually happened. Um, uh, so um, at, at some point, we will have to use that bit of infrastructure more effectively, and we'll have to um, you know, send more of Scotland's imports and exports to Europe, you know, by rail, you know, through, through the Channel Tunnel. We should revisit. I think so, I think so, yeah. Dr. Piercek? Yeah, the, uh, there will be opportunities in the trans-European transport network, so with all the corridors, I think it's important to make sure uh, Scotland is well connected uh, to that. Okay. Okay, uh, Professor McKinnon, just on the Channel Tunnel, what, what is the the reason why you think there's been the, the lack of uptake? Uh, oh, a number of things. Um, I, I think many people perceive it as a passenger rail network, mm -hmm. right? But there is still you know, excess capacity that could be used for, for freight. Th there were is it more problems. expensive? Because obviously, you know, if we haven't seen yeah, the economics shift from road to rail, it's yes. the point that you made earlier. Yes. Uh, is it the same reason um, for the Channel Tunnel? Uh, okay, so co cost was an issue. Um, uh, illegal immigrants was a problem. There was, in fact, still is. You know, so there are very tight uh, security restrictions on freight trains moving through the Channel Tunnel, which is a is a problem. But if I cite the case of um, Procter and Gamble, um, recently have started running a train. So it, it was difficult to negotiate that with the. Um, with the rail authorities, but it now works. It runs, I think, from Lille through to to London. Um, uh, you know, a dedicated train just just for themselves. So if, if a company makes a serious effort, they, they can overcome these various barriers, actually, to, to achieve uh, such, such a service. I, I Picking a point that Derek mentioned earlier, um, the railways, it seems to me, are very risk-averse. You know, they're very hesitant about launching new services unless they're guaranteed regular flows um, over a long time period. And, and I just think it, they could be a bit more entrepreneurial in, in attempting to do this. Uh, now, the situation may now change because I understand that the ownership of the Eurotunnel is, is now going to be, oh no, no, I think that's Eurostar, is going to be entirely with France. I think Britain has sold its share of, uh, of the Eurostar service, but I think that's, that's the Eurostar service rather than the tunnel itself. So I think that's, that's, that's a red herring. Okay. okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, Mike, you've got some questions on ports. Yeah, thank you, convener. I'd intended to ask three questions, but with your indulgence, I think I'll consolidate them into one question, uh -huh. particularly as some, some areas have already been discussed, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in uh, ferries and uh, um, I just wondered uh, what might be done to encourage some of the freight off the road onto cargo ships or ferries, um, bearing in mind that we've only got one uh, cargo fa ferry operating a direct route to uh, Europe, um, what could we do uh, um, to make uh, uh, cargo destined for Europe, you know, uh, go directly from Scotland rather than down to England. Um, and uh, are there any policy or <coughs> regulatory obstacles to the uh, free flow of sea freight uh, in Scotland? Uh, looking back to some of the the, the work to get the Resythe to Zabruga ferry off, I mean, we were 
uh, working on Scottish Enterprises transport strategy at that time and some of what they were actually doing um, to try and, you know, a, a, a approach, a, you know, something that was important, seen as important for Scotland's economy. We'd always had a ferry link fr from there. And looking back at how the rules were kind of, you know, uh, looked at in as tactical a way as possible to create the freight facilities grant to make all that happen. And um, uh, 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 and and uh, I, I kind of reflect on that in the context of what I've been saying around around partnership. Wouldn't it be if we, if we could provide the certainty twenty years ahead that the government was a stakeholder in both the risks and the reward, i.e., earning money for the government, like in many parts of Europe would be fairly standard practice with ownership of ports and 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 and, 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 and stakes in in that sort of thing? Then what we could do is give the industry the certainty that there would be a link there in five years' time. Because if every five years we have another crisis, or oh, will we lose this route? Then, if you're a um, logistics or a haulage company, or whatever, uncertainty is the thing you do. Well, you want least, and you think actually we'll just stick with road or or go with rail because it will be there in twenty years' time. Will the ferry be there? I'm going to plan my operations around that. That uncertainty is the fatal the fatal flaw. But governments are going to be there, and if government this is government backed, it's like having a government backed bond that government is a stakeholder. In in the operation of that ferry service somehow as a partner that, say, shares in the risks, shares in the rewards. Um, that type of partnership I would see as much more progressive than just saying, oh, here's your five million, go away and do what you can. And, and, and so I think that's the shift. It's, it's, the, it's following the same theme, but actually it's about saying, you know, realistically, there will always be a freight link between <laughs> Rosyth and Zabruga. And if we give the industry that confidence, that would really, really help. Um, yeah, of course, it's not just the Rosyth uh, ferry. I mean, it's also the container services from Grangemouth to Europe, you know, connecting deep sea, deep sea services there. Um, and I understand that in, in terms of port capacity, we've, we've more than enough capacity to meet demand for the foreseeable future. I, I think at Grangemouth, they reckon they could handle up to 400,000 containers, and we're well short of that at the moment. Um, w w in the case of Grangemouth, um, I mean, if you look at ports around the world, Port capacity is tending to move out of river locations onto coastal locations, you know, so that they're, they're non-tidal access. Um, and I know for many years I, I thought it would be sensible for Scotland maybe to develop a new port on the coast. Um, but then again, I moved to Hamburg. And uh, you know, Hamburg is Europe's second port, and it's six hours steaming time up a river, right? Um, and why? Because it is well connected to inland infrastructure. Right, and, and you could say exactly the same of Grangemouth. Okay, so you've, you've got the problem of the steaming time up the river, the dredging cost, for example. But on the other hand, Grangemouth is so central and it's so well connected into the road and rail networks, I think it makes sense to, to retain that as our main uh, container port. Um, as, as for the Rosyth Ferry, um, uh, it gets back to what I said right at the start that, that the flows, international flows from Scotland are quite thin. You know, we, you know, if, if our economy was to greatly expand and, and, and we use forms of manufacturing that generated lots and lots of freight, then all these services would become more viable. But um, for the foreseeable future, I, I think, um, given the volumes of traffic that we have, that's not going to be the case. And of course, hauliers and, and manufacturers in Scotland, they have a choice. They can either use the direct service, or if they feel it's more competitive, they can go down to Teesport or Felix store or wherever. I, I think it's, it's right that companies have, have that choice. Um, and um, I think the Scottish government's done the right thing in providing a subsidy to maintain that direct link. But, but if at the end of the day it fails, um, I mean, our exporters will still find alternative routes to market through ports in England. Yeah. It may be also an issue of the policies at the big ports. So sometimes they prioritise the uh, railway connection to the hinterland as opposed to feeder services because the, uh, uh, having bigger ships is more revenue making than having smaller ships. Uh, uh, on the feeder services, so the issue may not necessarily be. We need to understand the entire system to see uh, what the, what the problems are and how to how to uh, mitigate those. I mean, last point, because that seemed to me to be an important one, and, and, and I'm just a bit concerned that the committee had a visit out to mm. Greensmith uh, recently, and um, you know the, the the plan to dredge it. Uh, mm -hmm. I think fairly soon to increase the depth because there's this trend for 
bigger shipping and yeah. they're kind of forced to do that. But I just wonder at the, the wisdom of, you know, this incremental approach, if you see what I mean. Um, and if we get, if, if, if you get to a point where you reach the physical limitations, you just can't really reasonably dredge it any deeper. Um, and how long, uh, foreseeably, for how long this, this trend of bigger, bigger ships uh, is going to continue for. So at some point you make the decision and say, you know, we, we, we need to take a fresh approach and, uh, you know, if there are physical limitations here, do we do it somewhere else or do we have a genuinely deep water port and does that open up other possibilities? I'm just interested to, to hear your thoughts on that. Be the chairman of the Scottish Transport Study Group and, and, and we produced a discussion paper on this very subject oh, 25 years ago when we looked at the possibility of having a, a coastal port in Scotland, I think at Dunbar or maybe Cockenzie or somewhere. Um, very, very expensive because it's not just the port you have to construct. I mean, it's all the related infrastructure as well, the, the road links and the rail links and, and so forth. Um, as for dredging, um, you know, Hamburg, which I mentioned earlier, recently received the world's biggest container ship, right, 19,000 TEU, um, you know, which went all the way up to Hamburg. So, I mean, the, the German government can happily dredge the Elbe, you know, to, so I, I, I think, you know, the, the ships we are talking about are, are the smaller transshipment vessels, you know. Um, so I, I would have thought for the foreseeable future we could probably sustain Grangemouth with, uh, uh, I mean, if, if we were ever to have a deep sea vessels coming back to Scotland directly, then I think your point would be valid. But I think so long as, as our services are going to be transshipment services with smaller vessels linking to Rotterdam or Zeebrugge or Felixstowe, uh, I, I think we could just continue to dredge the, uh, the fourth. Okay. Uh. okay um, who's next? Adam, I think. Adam next. <coughs> Just to follow up the port questions, if I can, we've had some evidence from Professor Alf Baird who suggests that uh, the port infrastructure in Scotland hasn't been well developed <coughs> and, and he, um, there's been a lack of investment in ports and he points the finger at the um, unconventional ownership um, uh, regime in Scotland's ports, which seem to they seem to operate <coughs> very much um, uh, in their in their own interests, and it could be argued uh, they're almost monopolist in their in their approach. Um, do you think we should be, the Scottish government um, should be should be looking at this particular situation in terms of trying to uh, create? more of a driver of economic growth through our ports. Is that something we should be focused on uh, in this committee as well? Uh, when I mentioned there was a study done 25 years ago, it was actually done by Alf Baird, right? <laughs> who has been very critical of fourth ports and, and in particular underinvestment in Grangemouth for many years. Yeah. And so he was advocating the development of a new port, presumably with a new port operator, to create a bit of competition for uh, for, for the port. I, 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 I've got some, some, some sympathy for his arguments. I mean, I think Fort Ports does have monopoly control, really, of the, of the Fort Estuary. Um, and um, I, 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 really, I don't know enough about the port sector to say how we could alter that situation, uh, about you know, whether we could in, you know, change the ownership structure. I, I'm, I'm out of my depth, I'm afraid, on that issue. I'm sorry. Okay, you had mentioned, you mentioned uh, Mr. Halden had mentioned the lack of entrepreneurial... Uh -huh activity well, by well, uh, real uh, companies is that can can we s put the same charge to the port authorities yeah i mean, I mean, I mean Scot scotland is a relatively small country but we can be the best in the world at some things and this is i think what the view i would have of that issue is well we were looking at this 25 years ago knowing the economics of the maritime um sector were changing and moving to bigger and bigger boats and was there a real opportunity to go out and make this an area where scotland was um one of the hubs and um i'm not sure that um that that agenda has evolved quite in the way that um, 
that would visit. I'm not the expert. I'll, you, it's Alf. You, you need to speak to him. That I'll, Alf, Alf basically um, would would argue very strongly that you know the boats are getting bigger and bigger, and we're going to need something like that. I mean, certainly I'm aware of lots of world cities, uh, not particularly Hamburg, but lots of world cities that are currently looking at the port infrastructure, saying, "Help! What do we do? How, how are you know?" So, so, so the maritime industry globally is changing very fast, and there's a lot of really important hubs in many countries around the world that are looking and saying, we just can't continue to operate anymore. It's going to have to be somewhere else. So could there be what we're saying about uh, consolidation? Could there be space for scapa flow or something like that? Well, perhaps there could, but what, but, but, but you know, we've got to be sure that we can genuinely get that competitive advantage and be the world centre for it. And I think all of the stuff I'm looking at is about very reasoned judgments saying, well, let's not be second best or third best or whatever. Let's go and try and say we can be the best in the world at whiskey, that's great, let's go and do it. What else can we be the best in the world at? And uh, that requires ensuring that we've got all aspects of logistics and transport to ensure that that absolutely happens and that we're building an economy around whatever it is we want to do. And it's that area of what would be the economy we'd be building around it at Scapa Flow that, as it were, makes it hard to see how all the cross the cross, the cross cross subsidies work between different sectors of the economy. But they might be there, you know, they might be, be, be be things that can happen. So <clears throat> you would tend to agree with them then that we should be looking at a Scottish maritime policy, which we don't have at the moment in terms of... I, I think the lack of clarity in, in what we want to do, you know, back to what I was saying about travel choices for Scotland, the lack of clarity about what Scotland, sort of Scotland we want is the number one thing holding back Scottish transport. Okay. Uh, can I change the subject? Um, uh, on to efficiency and carbon emissions. I think we've already had a fairly extensive discussion about um, uh, uh, programmes that you were advocating in terms of reducing the carbon footprint. Um, what about the use of technology, uh, new technologies, be it vehicles, transport information, or logistics technology um, that can make transport operations more efficient? Um, less costly and more sustainable. Have you anything to say on uses of technology? Oh, well, I'll, I'll start on this one. Um, we need a range of measure. Technology is only one side to the solution. Um, and it's not a single technology. We, ha we need a whole range of measures. And some of these measures will, uh, for example, in the road freight transport sector, they, they will some of the technologies will come in as a standard fitted onto new uh, vehicles. Some will be retrofitted by the operators if there is a clear um, economic case for doing so. But where the big savings come in is actually the way we operate our freight and logistics systems. So you can make a vehicle more efficient. So for example, you train the driver, that will probably give you about 10% of improvement in fuel efficiency. But if this driver then drives a vehicle that it's only full one way and comes back empty, that's not going to drive the overall emissions. Where the real saving comes in is having the same vehicle full both ways, because then you replace four separate movements with effectively two movements instead of having two trucks, you're now sending one. So I think we, we need to look at the whole package of things. We need to look at the new technologies, and there will be uh, new fuels, uh, there will be new mix of fuels, there will be alternative powered vehicles, there will be uh, uh, improvements in IT systems supporting freight systems. So there will be improvements in our dynamics. But uh, also a very important part to the solution is actually looking at the ways we operate logistics and how to make the process better, how to encourage companies to collaborate with each other, how to make the loads visible so it's easier to find something to take back, and how we can facilitate that process. And if you want an estimate how all of this uh, will add up to the, uh, to the uh, total carbon saving, there is a report coming <laughs> out in about a month or so. <laughs> OK, well, hopefully that we can feed that into our report. OK. Just to elaborate on the, what Maya said, um, in the work that we've done on, on the decarbonisation of logistics, I mean, we said that there are basically five things you can do. Uh, one is, is to restructure your supply chain at a strategic level, right, just to reduce the demand for transport, right? Um, 
Level below it is, is modal, modal shift, as we've discussed, get more freight onto low carbon modes. The next thing is to use the vehicle capacity more effectively. On that point, incidentally, what we don't have for Scotland is statistics on the utilisation of trucks. We've got the data for the UK as a whole, like the load factors and the vehicles, the amount of empty running, but we don't have figures for Scotland, and that'd be quite useful to have. Um, next level down is the, the fuel efficiency with which the vehicle is driven. And there's a big win there because there's a lot of research to show if you train drivers to drive the vehicles more fuel efficiently and then you monitor their driving behaviour using telematics, that can save you 5, 10, 12% on fuel and, and CO2. And then the final thing is switching to alternative fuels as well. And just on, on that, again, since you're the infrastructure committee, um, there's another, an infrastructure we haven't discussed here, which is providing infrastructure um, for the use of gas, gas-powered vehicles in Scotland, you know, to, to encourage a shift to, to gas. Because of all the biofuels, the one which comes out clearly as, as yielding big greenhouse gas savings is biomethane, right? But at the moment, we don't really have much of an infrastructure in place to, to deliver that. So, so yeah, and I, I remember Al Gore once said that in trying to deal with climate change, it's not a silver bullet we're looking for, it's silver buckshot. And that's true, because there's a whole spread of things we could apply here to try to decarbonise freight transport. with all the collaboration points and I suppose the, 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 the key point is that technology is an enabler to be able to do good things. It's not going to fix any of the problems in itself. Uh, but where it is fixing things very quickly and short action, you know, immediate good things can happen is in our towns and all the local delivery stuff, you know, the sort of uh, uh, how, how people react, how they behave in the towns, how, they, how we manage all the local the local delivery stuff. And there's there's huge benefits in there of of, uh, of deliveries just coming to sort of uh, local a few local points. So uh, that, that's where I would focus the technology type stuff. Obviously, the fuel, the, the, the vehicles, perhaps not just to miss this issue. I mean, if we if we are to do things, Things like the A9 dueling now, then we really don't want to miss out on the re ensuring that set up for intelligent highways. I mean, uh, Alan's referring to some of these in Germany and Canada and Netherlands, all over the world. People are doing trials of uh, uh, of the sorts of technological infrastructure that will enable the, the 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 you know speeds to be managed in the most optimal, efficient way, and you know lor uh, you know tr lorry trains or whatever. You know, the, 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 all of that's coming. Uh, we're not quite there yet. It would just be having been someone that worked on the A9 and fighting as hard as we could on the current A9 to get as much of it built as dual carriageway as possible then when the rest of Europe was being built as dual carriageway, it would have only cost an extra 15 or 20 percent to build it as dual carriageway in the first place, which the rest of Europe did. It was an incredibly short-sighted decision to build it single carriageway and it was only done because somebody was reading a London-based highways capacity manual that said with a flow of 10,000 vehicles we build this as single carriageway, which might work in Surrey, but absolutely, it was never, ever sensible for Scotland. So it was, you know, in my view as a consultant working on that, crass incompetence of government to build it a single carriageway. And all I'm saying is, if we're rebuilding it now as dual carriageway, for goodness sake, let's not miss out on the next generation of technology. Um, well, well, but 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 one of the reasons, I mean, if we look at say the French and why they've got so much money for transport infrastructure, is because they do toll the long distance roads, and and you know every country's got what's acceptable, what's um, uh, what's happening. We have to work out how what, what's what's right for Scotland. We have to get the the right revenue streams right for Scotland, and we have to invest in the right things. I'm just saying, if we're going to spend billions. Let's make sure we don't miss out on the technology things, and actually make sure it is built as an intelligent highway now. Uh, or at least the, the capability to make that happen. Supplementary. Opportunity to raise the point about uh, A9 duelling. At the same time, should we not also have some sort of policies about ensuring that when we are developing our roads that we have a, a statutory duty that there's a fibre optic cable uh, down as well for broadband and even mains gas and as a uh, my ex, uh, the convener of Highland Council, said at one stage the great advantage about putting a fibre optic cable in the A9 is you wouldn't have the same problem with snow clearance. Perhaps a slight tongue-in-cheek point, but it does make a little bit of sense. Yeah, it, it, it certainly, it, 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 
it was always a mantra in, 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 uh, yeah. in one of the offices I worked in that sort of, what, what, you know, always put down a few extra underground ducts <laughs> because you, you don't know what you'll be using them for, but you will be using them. And mm. um, it's, it's just a case of they cost nothing to add to the road and they build mm. in enormous flexibility for what you're going to do in the future. So just do it. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe something I, I could add on that. Uh, this is going to be looking a few generations into the future. Uh, Germany is experimenting now with electrified highways because uh, near Berlin there's a two kilometer test track and they've developed trolley trucks you know, which can run either in overhead electricity or, or on diesel fuel or whatever. Um, and that's been very successful. So they're now trialing this on some of the autobahn as well. Now, there'd be no point in us doing that at the moment for climate change purposes, given the electricity mix that we currently have. But if Scotland fully exploits its renewable energy technology and we decarbonize electricity, then there may be a time in the future when it'd be sensible for us to electrify maybe at least one lane in some of our more heavily trafficked roads. So it's, you may think of it as science fiction, but it may come. No, that's um, actually what I was alluding to in terms okay. of... Men the Canadians are doing that as well. And then what I'm saying is, really, ab absolutely, it, it's, it's that type of thing that we need to be looking and saying, well, we don't... The, the idea that we would build a road now, and we're, we're talking of, oh, by 2020 or 2030, we might have finished this. By 2030, we'll be looking at very different technologies. It will just look silly if we built a dual carriageway and not put this stuff in. just talked about government uh, decisions a long time ago, but now we want to talk about government support just now. The, how do you see the, the role of Scottish government in terms of helping with the interconnectivity con of the freight transport? And also, given the financial structures that are in place, uh, where would you see the priorities in terms of infrastructure? Well... <laughs> Well, we've obviously um, identified a, a few bottlenecks, if you like, in the network, you know, already. Um, uh, Coke Bridge, um, the, uh, the M8, you know, maybe dueling the, uh, the A9. Um, uh, as I, I often feel that the main impact that public policymakers can have on transport isn't so much physical in terms of infrastructure. It's more in best practice programs and, and facilitating uh, because potentially th they're where the big benefits are. We've spoken a lot about collaboration. Um, as I was involved in an EU funded project called CO3, uh, which has worked with a number of big companies in Europe, uh, encouraging them to share their vehicle capacity and to share their warehouses, um, which they do for economic reasons, right? But it yields substantial environmental benefits, it reduces the amount of traffic, um, and you know, potentially those have more impact. In, in a country that already has good infrastructure, and I've been very complimentary about the Scottish infrastructure, I, I think any improvements are likely to be fairly marginal in, in, in the future. Um, there would be a case for a, a more ambitious programme of infrastructural development if we could see the traffic volumes were rising steeply, but we're not seeing that. You know, certainly the freight volumes have pretty well stabilised. Um, even car mobility um, is, 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 is not increasing very much. So, so there's, there's a, a question mark over just how much additional infrastructural capacity we require. So therefore, I would like to see public policymakers shifting away from the hardware, you know, from the physical infrastructure, to more, more towards the software things, IT-related stuff, and also encouraging changes in business practice uh, as well. Are you suggesting then that it's more about coordination and collaboration that, than mm -hmm. building yes. new infrastructure? Yes, exactly. Breaking down the silo structure that exists in the transport area and getting the modes to work more, more effectively together. Now, another thing I think we could do is, and this is I think something we discussed back in 2006, is looking at the sort of portfolio of freight transport services that you will require in Scotland you know, to be a, a prosperous country, which goes beyond modes. Because within any transport mode, there's a range of services. And what we have to make sure is that we've got a you know, healthy, competitive market for all these different services within each of the transport modes uh, as well. And I think there's a role for the Scottish Government, really, in trying to ensure that. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, it's... it's, it, it, it's it, 
it's this point about the hubs, that if we've got hubs where uh, anywhere in the country it's very easy to see how you can plug into the railway network or the, the, the you know, how the road network, how it all comes together. And it, um, I mean, certainly multimodal thinking. I mean, there's some questions in the inquiry um, uh, d documents about sustainable modes. So I just wanted to make the point that so all modes are always the most sustainable ones sometimes and it's it's important the minute we start saying oh rail sustainable and roads not and all sort of stuff or walking sustainable or whatever you know walking is simply not a sustainable way to move heavy loads to china you know i mean it's 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 it, so so actually it, it, you know we we actually have to look at look at which mode is the is the most sustainable mode for for each thing and this quiet comes back to the very first point i made it's about hierarchy of nodes and, 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 and the hubs. And if we make sure that we have planned that effectively and we haven't done, and everybody seems to agree that we haven't done, and that was what we were saying 30 years ago that we should do, and what I'm saying is, and everybody still seems to agree it's something we should do, so I'm saying if nothing else comes out of this, then would we, you know, could we start to create some clarity around um, answering? It's, it's, oh, I mean, we do a lot of this in passenger transport where what we call accessibility planning, where we say, let's start at the house and say if I want to get to buy to buy a fridge how do I get access to that where do I go if I want to get to hospital what do I get access to and it's just an audit as a reality check and what what life feels like on the ground for the for the consumer for the resident for the business can they actually succeed and it, it's so enlightening because when you look at that you say Actually, they can't succeed. That's why they're complaining about it. <laughs> and, and, and I think it, so. So, to answer your question in the most simplest type of way, the reason why why you know you, you feel the heat as politicians, I would imagine, is because actually, when you stand back from that user focus of the system as a business, you know, can I actually use the rail system? No, I can't actually. Then, then that helps to define um, in a totally non-modal transport way what it is you need to do to allow people to get access uh, to the markets, to their to, to their suppliers, to their uh, whatever it happens to be. Dr. Yeah, I think the, the key to a good infrastructure system is the understanding of the freight flows. So you need to know where the stuff's coming from, where it's going to, and why it's going there. So once you have this clarity about the Scottish freight flows, then you, you, you can start planning your uh, vision and your system, and you know where all the gaps uh, the government should direct the support to. There were a few studies in the past. I think, uh, uh, Jason, you were part one of this about on various commodities and foodstuffs, mapping the Scottish freight, uh, freight flows. But I think we need a wider understanding of, uh, of what are the commodities being moved. We know whiskey is one of the main exports, but what about other things in Scotland? Where is the products moving and why are they moving when they're moving? So that's one part of the problem. And the second important issue is this interaction between freight and passenger movements. So we're not building infrastructure or we're not improving infrastructure only for freight only. Most of the infrastructure is shared between passenger and freight, passengers and freight, and we need to understand the connections and interactions there to be able to, to, to develop a sort of sustainable infrastructure system for Scotland. One last question. There's been some talk about uh, an updated freight policy for Scotland. Is there anything outside of what you've just said that mm. you would suggest should be in that, and, and how could you see that new policy assisting the sector? I would add is, is the word resilience, um, because uh, and there's a, 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 in academic circles and business circles a lot of discussion these days about supply chain resilience and doing risk audits and um, and reconfiguring your supply chain. But this also relates very much to infrastructure. Um, so I would have thought a lot of future investment in Scotland's infrastructure will be climate proofing. It um, in, in the case of rail, maybe trying to improve the resilience of rail services by having alternative routes. So if for one reason a particular line is blocked, then at least we have some redundancy in the system to divert the, the, the freight trains in other directions. So so I, I think um, in, in any policy, I think resilience ought to be up there as, as one of the key objectives. Uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, can I ask, do you see the 
planning system operating effectively to support freight transport in Scotland? And by the planning system, I mean everything from individual decisions through to the national planning framework. This is, uh, I mean, land use transport integration is certainly an area I've done a lot of uh, work in. And the planning system um, is really on catch up. It got stuck for far too long and while we're now moving towards national planning frameworks um, there's so much legacy development out there the stuff that's already got planning permission inherited um, uh, issues about um, uh, you know that might might not be the way we would do it nowadays that the planning system is not working effectively for us um, uh, yeah, you know, I've alluded earlier to the the fact that you know there were you know ish things said in the national planning framework that were like changed within weeks, and you know that's not certainty for twenty years. And so if we want, you know, I I often highlight like you know on the passenger transport side, Copenhagen Metro built as a pension investment. We wouldn't get pension companies in Scotland investing in our transport infrastructure because transport policy isn't stable enough. You, you know, people want to know they're going to get the money back. Um, so so the planning system has to provide that degree of certainty and so if somebody's going to say right we're going to spend x billion on this land around this freight hub then they've got to know that we're not just going to change our minds and decide the freight hub's going to be somewhere else and uh, you know the money you know there's plenty of money out there <laughs> people just want to know that it's safe i mean i think it's the single uh, common theme across economic growth around the world at the minute is everybody's looking at an uncertain world economy and any certainty that we can give to people through a planning system to say yes this is going to happen this is where the, the commitment is that will attract the money uh, so it's almost like it needs less government funding that what government can do is provide the provide the certainty and and i think that's where the planning system goes in the planning system is uh, uh, the way we structure it to give genuine certainty how do we get from here to there i.e a planning system that's now l so damaged that as it were there's an expectation of oh even although it's been given planning permission it's in the national planning framework we might still do something different is a huge issue it's a massive issue for transport planning because uh, it means that if I wanted to fund a transport scheme, I would probably do better joining the local chamber of commerce and getting them to lobby for it as a great investment important for the Scottish economy so that it becomes politically impossible for politicians not to put public money into it. And then you we know end up the spending... system works, don't you? Well, well, well <laughs> what I'm saying is, that, you know, I'm just observing the reality of where we are now and saying, you're saying, can the planning system work for us? What I'm saying is, well, absolutely it can, but it's not going to be like an over overnight one that we can take a planning system with hundreds of inherited commitments about what's been given you know planning permission for housing if you change any of that or whatever these developments you'll be hit with pl your planning authorities will be hit with compensation claims for stuff and I mean, it, it, this is something that takes 20 years to rebuild a new type of planning system and yes I, it, the stuff I see going on now with the planning reform is all heading in the right direction it's all good stuff but we've got to look at other ways how do we come Complement the planning system with the the business wraparound, the new business models, how we partner effectively, because that's how I see we can do stuff faster than try and say the planning system is how we'll 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 we'll, we'll, we'll unlock a lot of what we need to do. Just a general feeling I've had over the years is that um, a lot of planners still think in terms of, of freight transport being an isolated activity. Whereas companies these days think of logistics, you know, where the, the transport is integrated into the handling processes, the inventory management, the warehousing and so forth. So a, a, a general exhortation to, to planners to, to try to adopt that logistical perspective that companies take. And I think particularly in urban areas, because as we've discussed previously, there are a lot of city logistics innovations. Um, and I think some are being obstructed by planning restrictions. Um, we, we mentioned nighttime delivery, for example, you know, so sometimes you're not able to deliver to a shop in a city centre because the planning approval that shop got restricted the number of hours in the day when that delivery was possible. Um, uh, we mentioned urban consolidation centres. Um, th th there are a whole spectrum of things that you can now do to try to rationalise freight movement in urban areas by deploying these city logistics measures and what we have to make sure is that the planning system can accommodate these these measures. I think for example you're going to the Netherlands, is that right, to see the um, the Binnenstadt system? 
um, which I think is very interesting and it'd be worthwhile looking at the planning implications there because they've had to change the use of um, property in the city centre to, to make it essentially into a, a, a consolidation centre and I think in a few cities they run into some difficulty in actually converting the land use so that's something you might want to consider. Of uh, integration of um, freight, uh, freight decisions and land use planning decision is a key. It's important when planning new developments. So, for example, if you new build a new residential area, you need to uh, think how these people are going to receive deliveries. We know online shopping is on the increase, so there will probably be not only a lot of passenger traffic uh, generated by that, but there will be van deliveries. There will be uh, uh, small uh, small trucks delivering uh, to that particular area. Also, certain types of uh, high street will have freight flows associated with, with them. So looking at uh, freight as a part of other activities as opposed to standalone activities is a key here. On a slightly different subject, I noticed one of the earlier answers, there was a, a particular set of statistics, I think it was for road transport, which were available for the rest of the UK, but you said weren't available for Scotland. How good are we uh, in Scotland at uh, assembling these statistics? And are we in a position where uh, we have enough information to be able to assess whether policy interventions actually work or not? Very good question. Uh, being, being academics, I mean, data is our raw material, so we're, we're very sensitive to this issue. Uh, incidentally, I've just written a report for the OECD on the, the freight data you require around the world to develop freight policy. I'll happily provide that to the, to the committee. Um, the, the, the Scottish Transport Statistics volume published every year, a compendium of data is excellent, you know, and I, I would, you know... Um, compliment the statisticians that they compile such a thing. A lot of the data they get from the Department for Transport, you know, the Roads Goods Survey, for example, is a, a UK-wide survey, and then they simply extract the Scottish data from that. Um, but uh, again, although I'm praising the, that, that particular volume, um, it, it doesn't have data on everything. And, and one big gap, I think, is to do with uh, utilisation of vehicle capacity load factors, um, empty running of vehicles, uh, information on the fuel efficiency with which trucks in Scotland are used, um, the proportion of alternative fuel that's used by trucks in Scotland. These are all things we need to do to factor into a calculation of what the carbon intensity of road freight is in Scotland, and we don't currently have that information. Now, it may be available within the Scottish Government, but it's, it's, it's not published uh, at, at present. What does government need to do to uh, facilitate well, the collection of that information? Yeah, okay. Um, well, I, I, that data is available at a UK level, so mm -hmm. the published figures are for the UK as a whole. It would be quite nice if we could um, you know, se separately present the Scottish figures. Um, it may be necessary, obviously Scotland is only 10% of the freight or 9% of the freight. Um, what we may need to do is increase the sample sizes in Scotland. Um, because otherwise, if the sample size is too small, then the sampling errors are very high, right? So it, it, there may be a case there for, um, for, for Scotland to, as I say, increase the, the sample size for trucks. There may be a case, some of this data may be available, it's just not published, and, uh, or that data may not be available because of the sample size. So then uh, an effort to increase sample size would, be, would, would help us to uh, improve the data availability. D data is changing very, very fast, and uh, the sort of mechanisms I would be looking to rely more on are, I mentioned CILT's logmark type thing, enormously detailed data with all the companies. If we can persuade all companies to come into benchmarking schemes that are comparing every detail about load factors and fuel consumption and everything, that data is then available and shared in a, a anonymized way so that we actually have, have figures. So uh, instead of sort of old-fashioned, oh, let's go out and do a traffic survey on the road and find out where people are coming from and going to we actually have GPS tracking and we know that type of stuff actually most companies are happy to share that data in return for cash um, and so you know the, the data flows and the cash flows are actually 
Well, well, exa exactly, <laughs> exactly. But it's 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 actually what it's actually what people mean by the knowledge economy. Uh, you know, if you hear hear some of the stuff and uh, you know talked about, and some of the world growth. I mean, you know, companies like Facebook make their money purely from the fact mm -hmm. they are owners of information. So the knowledge economy is actually quite a big and important thing. And yet, government statistics are falling a bit behind in that they still view statistics as if they're something that's provided as a market failure because information was always a market failure rather than an area of market growth, which is where the information is now. So I think yeah, what I'd be saying about the information, let's use what's really out there and uh, bring it together uh, in uh, uh, you know, around a new marketplace for data and, and then the statistics will improve um, uh, you know, looking forward in all, in all these areas. That's a related point. I mentioned earlier that um, almost all the freight data we have, not just in Scotland, anywhere in the world, is weight-based. Right, it's a ton kilometre which drives all our analysis. Uh, we lack volumetric data, right? You know, cubic capacity, um, be because you know, for the UK as a whole, we, we can see what the um, average lading of a truck would be by weight, right? Um, but that doesn't tell us what the density of the load was. You know, so there are a lot of trucks that appear to be only partially loaded. They might only be carrying, you know, 10 tons when the vehicle could have been carrying 29 tons. But if that's of a very low density product, it could be all the cubic space is occupied. Exactly. Regu regularly, it's large lorry delivering flowers, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't imagine they no. weigh very much. No, exactly, exactly. It comes and, from Holland as well. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and all the evidence suggests is that, that freight is getting less dense through time. Mm -hmm. They were substituting lighter materials, you know, plastics for <coughs> metals and wood. Um, we're packaging more, using more handling equipment. So, so therefore, you know, trucking companies they need more cubic capacity these days than they need weight carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. And it'd be nice if we had data sets that allowed us to analyse that. Yeah. Okay. The, my final question is a bit of a catch-all, and you may have covered some of this before I actually arrived. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, are there any? Um, good examples of government interventions or funding models in other parts of Europe that would be particularly suited to transfer into Scotland? Well, well, well I mean, I, I, I think, I think the, the, the way that we put together, I mean, I, mean, I suppose the, the best, or one of the really interesting examples is finally, I, mean, I alluded to the sort of M8 com completion and actually the fact that it is finally being funded from pension fund type, you know, and sort of effectively as part of uh, investment and growth in the economy rather than it being seen as, uh, yeah, you, you know, no, no, no. if we can unlock transport um, investment in all sorts of areas, we will see fantastic things happening in our cities. <laughs> so, so, but, but it's almost like um, I, I, the analogy of that: if if the government's got two billion to spend, you can have all everybody else out there competing for the share of that two billion. Or you can have everyone working with you to turn that into 20 billion. And, and, and what I'm saying is that it's, it's about the way. So for every pound that government spending needs to buy another 10. You know, and, and in terms of we look at what we're going to need to do in transport, what we're going to need to invest in to create the uh, modern, intelligent, connected future world that Ever, you know, loads of countries are on that trajectory. We need to. We need to. Um, I think. I think the 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 world word, word that the the sort of CILT response put into this inquiry was we need a dramatic. Now you don't have to use the word dramatic. We need a dramatic change in the level of investment now to use a response. But that's how it. What it looks like to people doing an overview of how do we get from here to 2035, which is the word that was used in the CILT Future of Logistics paper um, on what, what you know what needs to happen and. And it is that dramatic shift in investment. It's not going to come from public funding. It's about how we use the limited funding, public funding we have, to unlock all the good things that could happen. And uh, so, yes, the, the M8 is maybe just starting to see the, the beginnings of, yeah, so we can unlock all this money like other countries in the world have been doing. I mentioned, you know, sort of uh, uh, you know, various projects uh, around the, uh, the world and how they package stuff up that's in ways that's acceptable to the populations. It's got to deal with the social issues, not just profits. It's got to be packaged up in a way that actually addresses all of the needs of the people. And I think too many of the early you know, PFI schemes were just 
um, uh, you know, badly run, badly organised. The, the the whole model's badly damaged in the Scots, you know, uh, Scottish taxpayers' <laughs> uh, per perspective. That needs to change. I mean, there isn't any alternative to changing. Uh, so, but 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 uh, you know, it, 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 but but eff effectively, how we bundle up, we can't have private individuals going out and spending all their money on private cars or private lorries or private buses or whatever, separate from the public investment system. All that's going to happen is the public system is going to lose if it does that because it's, it's so much less money. What we need to do is ensure that limited public money levers in a social, a more socially inclusive partnership direction the things that need to happen in Scotland. And then people are buying the good logistics inadvertently. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, maybe Scotland or the Scottish Government could prioritise logistics. Um, to put it into a global perspective, I mean, every uh, two years, the World Bank rates countries in the world in terms of their logistics performance, right? Germany is number one at the moment. The UK is number four, right? Now, they, they don't break it down by countries within countries like Scotland. Um, but Germany, um, the Netherlands, South Africa, um, France, uh, they are now prioritising logistics as a sector and promoting it, right? So this goes beyond just freight transport. It sees freight as part of this bigger logistics uh, system. Uh, because logistics has an image problem. I mean, what, one thing we didn't actually discuss um, earlier, you asked me what were the big issues back in 2006. One of the big issues then was a driver shortage, right? And I've noticed in some of the evidence to this inquiry that there's a feeling that there's still a driver shortage. And why is that? It's partly because freight and logistics has a bad image and it's not seen to be a, a good source of employment. Um, so what, one thing that we could maybe consider is, is just look at ways in which we could uh, promote logistics as an industry sector. Because it's so highly diffuse, there's so many companies engaged in logistics, we don't think of it as an industry in its own right. But, but there are now um, several countries that have, the, every year they produce a state of logistics report. The US, for example, looking at the state of logistics and what can be done to, to support it. So that, that's one thing. J just a couple of other minor things. Um, again, if we, if we look at Germany, one thing that, that is, is fundamental to German, Germany's freight policy is its toll collect system. It, it has a, a road user charging system for trucks. Um, so they reduce vehicle excise duty and fuel duty, and they tax the trucks by the kilometre. And they reckon that's had the effect of reducing the empty running of trucks. Um, it's uh, improved load factors. It's also helped to engineer a modal shift to rail as well. So again, maybe at some stage, we could return to the possibility that we would think of ways of maybe taxing trucks by the kilometre. That the high proportion of uh, heavy goods vehicles in Germany will be non German. It, it does, yeah, exactly. So I think about a, a third of mm -hmm. the truck kilometres on the German autobahn network are, are, are non German, yeah. whereas I think the equivalent figure for Scotland is about 3 or 4%, mm -hmm. right? But, but okay, so, so that, that was a big motivation they had for doing it. But I think you know, the principle could be equally applied here in, in Scotland or in the rest of the UK as well. engagement of the government and local authorities with academia and also with private companies to, to take the benefit of funding available, for example, as a part of the Trans-European transport, uh, transport Network or Horizon 2020, or also UK funding, there are various sources of funding available to actually fund research into how, imp how to improve the system and how to make it more efficient. So we, we need a more joined up approach to the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Do members have any other further questions? Okay, I think we've had a mammoth session uh, this morning, but I think it's been hugely helpful to the committee in informing its work on our inquiry. Can I thank the witnesses for their evidence today, and particularly thank Professor McKinnon for having me the longest uh, commute, although I, I, I rather suspect you didn't start out in your journey this morning. <laughs> oh, you do? Oh, I didn't realise that. Oh, well. <laughs> we're, still, we're still very grateful to you. Uh, and to all of the you. witnesses for their, for their time and their expertise this morning. So thank you. I now suspend the meeting briefly to allow the witnesses to leave the room.
Thank you. We now resume um, this session of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. The second item for today is the consideration of two negative instruments. The provision of water and sewage services, reasonable cost Scotland regulations 2015, SSI 2015-79, and the Scottish Road Works Register prescribed fees, regulations 2015, SSI 2015-89. Paper 3 summarises the purpose and prior consideration of these instruments. The committee will now consider any issues that it wishes to raise in reporting to the Parliament on these instruments. Members should note that no motions to annul have been received in relation to these instruments. Can I invite comments from members? Okay, there are no comments from members. In that case, is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to these instruments? We are agreed. Thank you. Um, today's final item on business is to consider a response from the Scottish Housing Regulator following the Committee's scrutiny of its annual report and accounts 2013-14. Members will recall that the Committee wrote to the Scottish Housing Regulator and a response has been received uh, from the Regulator providing a detailed um, response to the issues raised by the Committee. It highlights where action is ongoing to address concerns that have been raised and also areas where further work is required. The letter highlights areas where further uh, consultation and dialogue is required with stakeholders, including the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations and the Glasgow and West of Scotland Forum. For example, it outlines um, steps to address concerns about proportionality. Uh, the Scottish Housing Regulator will publish more information on how it conducts its assessments and the outcomes of those assessments. It will also be looking at ways in which it can uh, further improve transparency around its operations and the SHR um, is supporting the introduction of an appeals process and plans to consult on how an appropriate, independent and proportionate system can be developed and implemented. The SHR is working with stakeholders on a publication about how it applies the policies set out in its regulatory framework around cases where serious concerns are raised. In April, the SHR will issue updated information leaflets about whistleblowing and what will happen if concerns are reported. The content of these leaflets is being taken forward and discussed with the SFHA and the GWSF. It will work to improve the tone of its own publications and will aim to include more positive examples in future editions of its publications, Governance Matters and Performance Matters. It proposes to change and clarify the requirements for dealing with notifiable events, such as when a senior officer leaves uh, as a registered social landlord. It is exploring the potential to develop a framework agreement that both the SHR and registered social landlords can use to appoint consultants who may be required to support uh, RSLs experiencing uh, challenges. And finally, on the issue of the appointment of contractors, particularly in rural and island areas, it it has explained that landlords can use the comply or explain principle to deal with challenging situations. The SHR will also continue to work with the SFHA on its proposed model payments and benefits policy. Uh, so that an outline and in summary is um, the content of the response that we have received from um, the Scottish Housing Regulator. Can I invite uh, comments from members on that response? and on any further action which the committee should take. Mike? Yeah, convener, I mean, there are a number of areas that I feel still uh, unsatisfied with the response, but the particular concern that would draw to the con committee's attention is um, that of, that you, you touched on there, um, and it's about uh, the purchase by governing body members and staff or goods of goods or services from the RSL supplier or contractors. Now, um, it seems to me that the, um, the regulator has responded in almost identical terms to the previous response on that issue. Um, I'm not um, satisfied that they really understand how burdensome and difficult this is for housing associations in rural areas. I'd point out that this um, the, the problem affects not just uh, members uh, um, and staff, but also their family. And within rural areas and the limited local economies, it can be almost impossible to operate under the current conditions. And equally, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, um, uh, you know, to create uh, explanations 
sometimes on fairly trivial purchases and would be hugely burdensome. Uh, I also am aware of the fact, because certain uh, housing associations have been in touch with me, that um, this is an issue that's been, gone on, been ongoing for some years with no apparent resolution. And therefore, that's something I would hope the, the regulator could um, explain to us uh, in more concrete terms <coughs> and along with a timescale how they propose to deal with this. Okay, th thank you uh, for that, Mike. I mean, clearly the committee can write uh, again to the uh, Scottish Housing Regulator uh, and raise any specific points such as uh, the one you've just, you've just mentioned on which members feel further action is required. Can I invite further comments from members? Please. Can I just suggest that, um, you know, a, a kind of interchange of letters where we're just kind of, re you know, reply in like terms. I, I just wonder if there's a possibility of them coming back to the committee uh, for further discussion of some of these issues. Yeah, I think that's a good uh, suggestion. Um, and it's certainly something that we we could take forward to member. Any other members have views on that? Okay, in that case, um, is the committee agreed to, to note the response that we've received and agree to invite the Scottish Housing Regulator and perhaps um, social housing sector stakeholders to appear before the committee to provide an update on the progress that has been made uh, and to do that before the summer recess in June 2015? Okay, and uh, do we wish to agree that we will write notwithstanding uh, Mike's comments, that we will write to the Scottish Housing Regulator asking them to uh, provide us with a, an update in advance of that evidence session and perhaps to prioritise uh, progress on areas that have been highlighted in the correspondence. And I'm thinking perhaps of the, the appeals process in particular. We are agreed. Yes. OK. Thank you. In that case, um, we'll now move on to... Um, a related issue, which is that members will be aware that submissions have been received from Dumfries and Galloway Housing Partnership and Dumfries and District Trades Union Council. The submission from the Trades Union Council covers a petition calling for a judicial review into what it considers to be a failure of the Scottish Housing Regulator to apply due diligence into the award of a £77 million contract to R&D construction, which subsequently became insolvent. The petition did not, members will wish to note that the petition did not come via the Parliament's public petitions um, process. The submission from Dumfries and Galloway Housing Partnership covers a communication to its tenants, which is intended to provide clarification of its position following recent media scrutiny relating to the concerns raised by the Trades Union Council. It indicates that payment uh, was only made for works carried out and completed uh, by R&D Construction. As part of managing risk, uh, DGHP uh, have stated that they also retain monies that acted as its insurance against any future losses it may have incurred. The money retained covered the cost of having to retender the contract after R&D ceased trading. They have suggested that there was no loss of public money. Funds for the regeneration work came from the Scottish Government, Dumfries and Galloway Council and DGHP's own private finance. All of this funding, they say, is accounted for and has been audited each year by DGHP's external auditors as part of the preparation of its annual accounts. When the Scottish Government, Dumfries and Galloway Council and DGHP undertook this regeneration programme uh, back in 2009, um, they have pointed out that a detailed tender process was undertaken in accordance with procurement law. They have further stated that, and I quote, R&D's tender was scored by all parties to be the best, end quotes, that it carried out detailed financial testing to ensure that all tendering contractors were financially stable enough to carry out a contract of such a size and that R&D passed the, the financial tests at that time. It further states that, and I quote, these financial tests were recently reviewed through an investigation carried out by a respected firm of auditors and it was found that DGHP acted correctly by appointing R&D, end quotes. On the specific point regarding its involvement in the management of contractual matters by RSLs, 
the Scottish Housing Regulator has responded indicating that RSLs are independent businesses and it is for landlords themselves to manage their affairs including the responsibility to ensure that they are financially healthy and delivering good outcomes for their tenants. The SHR also makes clear that it is the responsibility of each landlord to ensure that it meets all relevant legislation, regulatory standards and good practice in relation to all of its business decisions including procurement decisions on the award of contracts to build new houses or to maintain existing homes. Importantly, the point is made that the regulator has no role in the individual business decisions or due diligence undertaken by social landlords, nor is it uh, the role of this committee to be directly involved in determining the contractual arrangements of individual RSLs. Members will be mindful um, of the strength of feeling expressed by uh, the Dumfries and District Trades Union Council and the supporters of its petition. However, um, in deciding what action it would be appropriate for this committee to take, we do need to um, give due consideration um, to the context of our specific role and remit as a committee. And here I think it's um, worth referring to the legislative position. Uh, beyond the fact that Section 19 of the Housing Scotland Act 2010 requires the regulator to lay its annual report before Parliament, the Parliament is not given any specific powers in relation to it, its activities. In particular, it is given no power to adjudicate on complaints made about the regulator or to act as an appeal forum. Um, giving, <laughs> given all of that, um, can I invite members um, to express their views on, on this issue and how we should respond to the Dumfries and District Trade Union Council petition. Dave. Yeah, uh, thank you, Convener. Perhaps just for the record, I could draw a member's attention to the fact in the mid-80s I was actually a member of the Dumfries Trades Council, uh, but I haven't been attached to them, obviously, for a number of years, nor spoken specifically to, to Mr Dennis about the issue. Uh, members will also know my interest in petitions as the ex-convener, and I do feel the Parliament generally um, gets a lot of international recognition of the work it does in petitions. Um, I understand there may be some issues around admissibility, but my advice to the committee is that we do try and get um, an admissible petition, petition from the Trades Council so that the Petitions Committee can consider it. I do understand that this may well end up back with us, but nevertheless, I think we have to give uh, justice to the fact that the Petitions Committee is set up to look at these particular issues. And my recommendation is that we ask um, officials from our committee and the Petitions Committee to work with Mr Dennis to get an admissible petition so it can be formally considered by the committee that's set up to look at this, which is the Petitions Committee. Okay, uh, are there any other views that members wish to put on the record? Good idea. Okay, in that case, um, we are agreed uh, that officials of the committee will um, contact uh, the Dumfries and District Trade Union Council and uh, suggest that they pursue uh, the route of um, presenting a petition formally to the Petitions Committee. Okay, and can I also um, seek your agreement that we will write uh, to Dumfries and District Trade Union Council formally? Uh, as agreed. Okay, thank you, uh, colleagues. Um, that concludes today's uh, committee business. There is no meeting on the 25th of March. The next committee meeting will be on the 1st of April. On Monday, the 23rd of March, I will, along with Mike McKenzie, be visiting um, Skaraborg Logistics Centre in Falshurping in Sweden and the port of Gothenburg. Dave Stewart and James Donnan will visit the Binnenstad service in Nimogen in the Netherlands and a nearby port. And that concludes our session this morning. Thank you.